Uh, I'm, so I'm excited. I've got a specific question I want to ask Destiny. Oh, All boy. right, we'll, well just hold. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me let me read these. No, uh, I'll hold off on it. Uh, Jack says the Unz review. Is it Unz review or UNZ review? I don't know. I always say it. Unz. Wrong. Unz, it is Unz. Okay, that's what Ron Unz runs it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Unz review is featuring Eric Stryker's columns. FYI, uh, White Iverson just subscribed for a month, and every time I see his name, I start hearing the song from Post Malone. But uh, thank you. Uh, Pits of Cowboy says I am a serial noticer. I note many coincidences. Oh, here we go. King Porgy. <laughs> <laughs> King Porgy. <laughs> here we go. TRS gang gang rise up the right stuff the right stuff dot biz baby uh King Porgy also subscribed for a month. All right, we'll get to super chats again uh a little quicker than we did last night since some of them like to just disappear here on D Live, which I don't understand, but I don't run this website, unfortunately. As we found out last weekend, I don't <laughs> I don't run this website. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh so both Eric Stryker and destiny have been on this stream within the last what i don't know five six months uh destiny was back on in january to uh speak with uh mike enoch uh but as is tradition here on the kill stream i always let I always let the guests introduce themselves i'll start with you destiny why don't you introduce yourself to the kill stream audience hey i'm destiny um i do politics on twitch i'm a huge sjw slash libcuck i also do politics on youtube so i play video games so that's about it I think that's pretty. Yeah, I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Mr. Stryker. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Stryker. I do, uh, I'm a journalist, a, a cultural critic. I have a uh, page called National Hyphen Justice, and I do a radio show with Mr. Mike Enoch every Tuesday called Strike and Mike on the right stuff biz. There we go. Now, we usually have some type of uh, opening statements here. Now, most of this is going to be you guys questioning each other. We do have a few questions here or there, but you know how we do it on the kill stream. Uh, I guess I will let you start off, Striker, with your opening points here. Okay, so uh, my opening point is that, you know, nationalism is the solution. And what I mean by nationalism is third positionism. Uh, inspired indeed by the European populisms of the 1930s and 20s. Um, I also believe that uh, America has many problems ranging from economic to social. I think that the um, basic premise of what I'm saying is that uh, people of, of European descent in America, a nation that is an extension of Europe and has always been considered an extension of Europe and not just America, but also uh, all the new world uh, European homelands, whether it's Canada, whether it's Australia uh, with its Anglo-Celtic culture, Canada with its Franco-British culture, uh, Argentina and Uruguay with their Italian and Iberian cultures. Uh, these are unique nations all being attacked by mass immigration and neoliberalism. Uh, my intent in this uh, debate is to de-radicalize destiny from his neoliberal <laughs> worldview, which has killed uh, tens of millions of people. Today, neoliberal Zionists are basically planning to kill three million Iranians. So I, I want destiny to be able to rationalize why in the Second World War, when Britain and France declared war on Germany, 50 million people had to die. Why in, in Iraq, 500,000 children uh, at, at, under the age of five had to die because of sanctions where Madeleine Albright, the biggest neoliberal of the 90s in the Clinton administration, said it was worth it. I want to know how all of this can be justified just so, just so uh, people can have their illusion of liberal individualist maximalism and of course, so Wall Street can dictate the terms of the world down to where you live, down to what your community looks like, down to how your religion is practiced, everything. So that's just my opening statement. All right, Destiny, go ahead, sir. Um, I don't think liberalism wants to dictate any of those things to you. Um, the idea that American is seen as an extension of Europe and always has been is pretty comical to me, considering that American exceptionalism has defined like the idea of America over the past like 200 plus years. 
and um, the idea that what like, language are you these... speaking right now? Wait, 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 wait. Okay, yeah, go. The idea that we're going to fix like any of the major problems that are facing anybody in the world today by pretending that we just need to put more European ethnic people in one area is comically fucking stupid. And I guess we can talk about economic policy or foreign policy if you want as a part of that. And you're hilariously misinformed if you think I'm going to come on here and defend every single foreign policy blunder that the United States has ever committed, like the Iraq war, or pretend that that was a result of immigration or some Jewish conspiracy, I guess. Um, you pretty much covered almost like the, the last hundred year time span. So I don't know which parts we want to talk about in particular. I guess I'm generally more concerned with like current day affairs, but uh, we could talk a little bit of history if you want. Um, yeah, I don't know where you want to start. All right. Yeah, I was going to well, say, go ahead, yeah. Striker. Now go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Pardon me for interrupting. That's okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me let me uh, question your, your premise that America is not an extension of Europe. Uh, when you go to an opera house, where, where do the operas come from? They come from Italy and Germany. When you go see a symphony, whether you're in New York City or Pittsburgh or Los Angeles, where does the music come from? Who are the composers? They're Italians and Germans and Russians. What are the most uh, popular forms of music that America is known to export to the world? Yes, and that's not culture. That's rock and roll, hip hop, rap. Where do these come from primarily? So this is a that's total. Not, this is this is a loser that is topic. Not you, got, high, you have to, you have to go to the, you high culture. I'm, you have, you high have culture. to go to another subject besides music because it is the worst example you could have picked. Like jazz is one of the most important contributions that America has made on the world stage. Jazz music. is a <laughs> bastardization of the waltz. I, that's what jazz j jazz and, music. Wait, would you say that every single form of, of art is a bastardization of the art that it was derived from? You realize that every single like would you say that romanticism was a bastardization of classical music or that classicalism was a bastardization of baroque music or that baroque was a bastardization of the of the So, so you're like, saying this so is, this is a rap, ridiculous. So you're saying rap music is an ex is 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 an evolution of classical music. I mean, is that what you're saying? It's an update of it? Is it better? I mean, objectively. I don't, I don't mind rap music, well, no, no, but let's, no. let's sit here Hold and, on. And, and you, think you, about what you just said. <laughs> no, we, classical music... Wait, wait, wait. 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 It's time, like the worst time. topic you could have stumbled on. Like, I, I'm literally a music major. Like, dog, like, this is the just worst possible. you say it's the worst chosen. topic doesn't mean that what you're saying is true. Well, no, it's the worst topic because all music is derivative based on prior music. The most important musical contributions that America has made to the world, like the origins of, like, rock and roll and rap and blues like a lot of these things were inspired by african americans which are not european um th this is literally some of america's most important contributions to the world musically if you want to take some weird ben shapiro argument which seems strange for you to do about how rap isn't music i mean we can debate objectively like what you consider music i guess we can talk about that or we can talk about whether or not like uh, uh music that comes after other music is like an update of it i don't know if anybody would argue that romantic music is superior to classical music or that impressionist music or serialism is, is superior to what came before it those are just ridiculous. Like you're loading the, you're begging the question when you say things like, "Is rap better than classical music?" This doesn't make sense. It's not how you analyze would, art would or you, music. Would you would, would you put uh, Moby Dick in the same category as Harry Potter? I, I wouldn't. That they're both literature. literature. Yeah, they're literature. Do you think people are going to be reading Harry Potter a hundred years from now, like we read Moby Dick? Nobody listens no, to opera not. now, dog. Literally, no, nobody not. cares about opera. You don't, you don't, <laughs> what do okay, you mean? Listen. What? Wait, no, 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 wait. You're, you're telling me like it's important to see what people are currently listening to. Do you think people are walking into opera houses? Ironically enough, the only people that do are probably the Jewish people that I'm sure you're going to spend the majority of this podcast attacking. Like, come on, dude. Who seriously? Who seriously is blasting classical music and their fucking mm. Ford Focuses like driving down the street and their Honda Civics? Like, come on. You're not seriously going to make this argument to me. Is jazz a derivative? A lower derivative of the waltz. What do you mean because a lower derivative? It's a simplification and a Judaized version of the waltz. No, it's, it's the there's waltz nothing without the order. The, no, no. What the, waltzes are incredibly simplistic, harmonically speaking, compared to the rich textures that you can find in in jazz. I mean, like, what are you talking about? Come on. No, 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 wait, no, no, come on. No, no, hold on. I'm go I'm gonna be fair to you. I think we there's should no move. order. No, 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 to, there's no. no order to jazz music. There, what do you mean there's by no order? order? Define order. Jazz music is not ordered like music. What do you it mean by order? Have... Define order. It 
it does it's made up on the go. No, it's not. That jazz music <laughs> is made up on the go. That's no, why it sounds not. so stupid. What are you talking about? Jazz music is all That's not first of all, it's not a made tonal. up. It's not it's not a tonal either. There is a tonal center to the majority of jazz music, and it's not made up on the go. It jazz music is highly structured. Maybe you're mistakenly referring okay. to the idea that there are improvisation sections to a lot of jazz music, but guess That's what? To a lot about. yes, a lot you're, of the class if you've admitting actually listened, right. Well, no, 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 no. Having improvisational sections doesn't mean it's made up on the go. And also, a lot of classical music had improvisational sections as well, but people that listen to it, like you, that don't actually understand the origins of it, don't know that. A lot of the repeated passages that you hear in classical music, in the past, piano players would have actually been expected to improvise new passages there. But it doesn't happen anymore because classical music is seen as more of a museum than an actual modern-day like evolution of music. So if you want so, to say that so improvisation you, you means that there's an order to so it, you, that doesn't you even work for you. you. Where, where does... Where does what are the foundations of American culture? Whether it's music, whether it's the, way, the, the crappy full. I mean, I, I don't like the liberal you, philosophy, but the philosophy of the United States was not created by African philosophers. It was created by European philosophers during the Enlightenment. Okay. Now, let me, before you answer, Death, fathers, go ahead. What, what, before we, you answer, Destiny, I did, wait. Before you answer, I just uh, want to say this: so somebody in chat said the real JQ is the jazz question. <laughs> go ahead. I yeah. Did. So, um, Striker is American, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. That I'm just saying because I don't know what your health insurance is like. We don't have Medicare for all here. That pivot was actually so extreme. I'm worried you're going to injure yourself. So slow down. Okay. If you want to talk about like oh, the good. foundations What's of like, the if you why, talk about why are you attacking me personally? I'm trying to have an adult conversation with you. You would not be talking to me like this in person. So I appreciate it if you just talk to me and we can exchange ideas like two fucking adults. So Stop I live in LA. I live in LA. Ralph has been here. If you want to set up a real life debate, I'll do it any day of the week. Okay. I'm probably going to be able to. Sure. Bigger and scarier than you. Okay? I'm not. I'm like, not going. So, I'm not okay, going. Sure, sure. I know, but don't. Right don't yeah, okay, that's fine. But don't don't <laughs> sit here and pretend like I wouldn't talk to you in person. Like you're some big scary you, fucking you wouldn't dude. Be, okay? You wouldn't be. You wouldn't be snarking. And 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 insulting me. If and somebody saying, were to oh, legitimately is... say to me, uh, it, like in a straight face, to, right, to, to try right. to imply just, to me, just to try to imply to... to me that jazz has no order, I would be just I'm, as snarky. I'm, it is a I'm, hilariously I'm just... stupid fucking point. So yes, I'm I would just be. asking you to be an adult. Calm down. Maybe get your girlfriend to change your nappy. Calm down. Maybe maybe smoke some weed to take the edge off all the Adderall you just took. And then I don't need Adderall to get fired up when a musically illiterate okay. guy tries to lecture me about oh, how okay. jazz has right. no order. Okay. Okay. So guy, the guy that can... thinks rap is high culture is called me musically. Illiterate. I never said okay. that rap right. was high culture. Do you think that all you realize that musicians? I'm talking wait, wait, about wait, wait. culture. You realize that musicians in the 18th and 19th centuries and the 17th century they were seen as not high culture, right? Like these people were treated like dirt. That's they were seen not as true. It absolutely is true. A lot of these guys, even people like Mozart, struggled to make ends meet. These guys were not well, revered that's true. people. But that's that's a that's a problem with the capitalist system that does not subsidize culture. All that because rapid if see, capitalism if you see under those monarchies. If you, like, if you, if you, <laughs> hold on, hold on. If you see countries that did subsidize culture, uh, whether it's Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, whatever their flaws may be, you know they had Wagner playing outside of factories because it was paid for by the state in 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 the Third Reich. In the Soviet Union, uh, the the famous composer Prokofiev, one of the most beautiful. Uh, uh, music to the, that the world has ever seen. He came to America to try and make it, and because the clubs were all playing jazz, because it's for profit, and there's no money for culture, he had to return to the Soviet Union. He was subsidized, and the only reason we know the name Prokofiev is because the Soviets subsidized their culture. Whatever they're, I, I'm not pro-Soviet. I'm just saying that that is a problem of, of you know, cu good culture is not always going to be highly profitable in the short term. So that is that is a, a systematic problem. So, but re regardless yeah, of that, I, I, well, you know, this is, a, this is like a good focal point. Okay, let me let's let's back off a little bit. Okay, so this is a good kind of like testing ground, I guess, for our ideas for the rest of this conversation. When you you say a lot of things where you you're loading a lot of conclusions and, into just like simple questions, like what is good culture or is this better than that? Just because something was good a long time ago doesn't mean it will be forever good. No culture and no form of art 
whether it's painting or music or plays or literature, has ever worked like that. We do not spend all of our time in the 1900s. They didn't exclusively play music from the 1800s. The 2000s, they didn't play in the 20th century, they didn't play things from the 19th century. And then the 2000s, we're not going to play things from the 20th century. That's just how culture and everything works. You know, if you want to talk to anime fans, they wouldn't tell you to just watch Neon Gen or whatever Evangelion like a million times because that used to, or Akira the movie over and over again. We watch newer stuff. If you're a fan of music, you're not going to listen to operas exclusively from the 1800s. It doesn't make sense. We don't have an ear for that anymore. I'm not Culture saying changes. you have to listen to it exclusively. What I'm saying is that there's a reason why, uh, you know, if you go to, to your local Philharmonic, uh, the tickets are still 60 or $70 for a seat in most places. And if you want to go see Good Charlotte, uh, they can't even sell out the, the back room of a Denny's. There's a reason for that. Okay? The reason is One, because rich middle class assholes like to virtue signal to other rich middle class <laughs> assholes that they're cultured because people like you think that listening to music that was written over 200 years ago somehow makes you a more informed consumer of music, which it doesn't. Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking for the relativistic answer. Like, why? Where? It's I, not I don't about disagree. a relativistic answer. You're trying I, to present this I, idea. Let, can I finish? Can I finish? Sure, okay. I'm not asking. Uh, listen. Listen, again, let's calm down. Let's just talk like two civilized adults here, okay? The, the, the thing is, whatever the... I, I agree that there are some pretentious people that, that maybe go to the opera or they go to see classical music because it's, it's a status sim symbol. But why is that a status symbol and, and going to see uh, Good Charlotte or Limp Biscuit isn't a status symbol? <laughs> Why is well, that? It, it is. It was for people that were teenagers or people that today. were today. Why is it today? Aged so because bad, Good though? Charlotte is fifteen years old. I mean, no one cares anymore, right? Yes, and and Beethoven is much much older. But if if someone but nobody the, cares about Beethoven either. People don't go to well, Beethoven clearly, concerts. clearly, clearly, people are willing to pay a lot of money to go see a Beethoven. Concerto. If you when so, you wait, wait, you, this is this comparison is absurd. When you say a lot of money, do you think that more money has been moved in the in in the last decade by Beethoven related stuff or by Kanye West? Like Blink sure, One Eighty Two no, no, still you're, you're sells right, out concerts, you're right. like, and that's 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 a problem of capitalism, and it's also a problem of repetition because radio wait, stations don't play Beethoven; they play Kanye West. Uh, and they just repeat that. You go to the supermarket, you're hearing Kanye West. You go to, uh, you know, you, you go to the gym, you're hearing Kanye West. We don't, you know, it, it, it doesn't even make any sense because if you really want to uh, walk, run faster on the treadmill, how about you play a Prussian military march, right? So but wait, you the thing can, you is, like that, it. that is all that is all by design because culture is a product of people, and, and culture is also a product of elites. Wait, you, the elites have decided to turn the people of America into culturally bankrupt people because a people with no culture are people who are susceptible to become slaves, to become exploited. They can't fight back because they don't have the tools or the enlightenment to do it. That's why America is so chaotic. I mean, you look at what's happening in this country right now, and you see just how problematic our All system is. Right, can we? Is. Are we good on the like, gift gallop here? I don't need like the whole cultural spill. So everything. Look who's talking? What the hell's with the freaking? What, what are you talking about? Gish galloping? I'm talking You're about. You're like going off on this whole cultural. Conspiracy. I'm talking we're about talking the origins about... of culture. 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 We, we're not talking speaking, about the origins of culture. Cycles. No. Cycles and civil. I. We are talking because you said America is not a European. Uh, an extension. No, we were of talking about music I'm saying and why is. music is played in the stories. You You're why, trying to pivot off of this why subject because you realize how ill-informed you are. Why America in 1960? why the average American in 1960s America considered himself uh, a, a European in the new world and why an American in 2020 does not do so as much. The reason is because the top 200% of people, the gatekeepers of culture, okay, whoa, 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 hold media, on, wait, I haven't responded have like gone from the becoming shit. white wait, 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 men. This isn't one Jews. of the podcasts, dog. So let's let's back way the fuck up, like fifty two sentences ago. Okay, I don't know if you think you're like writing a blog post right now. What, what are you okay. calling me dog for, bro? I mean, come on. What do you? What do you? Okay, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mister uh, Mister Striker. Okay, my bad. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. So, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to call you right fucking pronoun. sir. No, <laughs> okay, no fuck that. We'll, we'll, go, with, joking, we'll go with Eric, okay? Uh, 
So oh, you, you can't have it both ways and say, well, people actually prefer, like I, I, I debate a lot of socialists and lefties that do this, where you're trying to say like, well, actually people really prefer these classical concerts. That's why they pay so much for the tickets. And then when I go, well, actually that's not true at all. You go, oh, okay, well, you're right. But that's just because of capitalism. You see how you're trying to have it like every which way? Like you're trying to simultaneously say that people have this preference for an arbitrary, by the way, a totally arbitrary selection of dates for music, right? Because we can go back over a thousand years if you want to talk about different types of music. But, but you're saying that there's some 200 year span or 100 year span where people actually have an, a, a selection for but for some reason capitalism is is keeping them from having that selection even though they really do but let, like, let me explain myself let me explain myself I'll, I'll clarify this in the in 1920s germany the most popular music was kind of jazzy and stuff like that in 19 in 1930s germany the most popular music was wagner the reason for this the reason Tickets are so expensive to see a Wagner, to see a Beethoven concert, to see uh, Prokofiev even, is because of capitalism. It's not available. The average person in America can't afford necessarily to go see one of these concerts. Like you said, it's only upper class people. You said this upper class people tend to go to this because it's so expensive to see them. So what I would recommend is you subsidize real culture and people will go and see it and enjoy so it. Think, working, think, working people wait. deserve to have culture and transcendence just like rich people do. And the fact that There's, we don't make that available to working people is something I disagree with from an ethical perspective. This, is, this has to be. There is a s incredibly small subset of people that are listening that are seriously considering these ideas. Like but they're we not can exposed. Go, we can to go. It. We everybody is exposed to classical music. Everybody knows what where light where sonata do you, where is. Can you, you, heard, you, you hear it you, you in get cartoons. It on the car radio. You hear you it in cartoons. You've heard it in school. Like everybody cartoons. know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, cartoons. Old is an easy cartoons. Way to, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Very sure. old cartoons. Sure. What, I mean, how many people are watching freaking cartoons from the '60s still? Not that many compared to do people you, that watch. We, we can the see stuff. the types of music that people torrent on classical websites or the types of music that people downloaded on Kazaa and Napster. There's not this massive thirst for classic and romantic era compositions like you seem to think there are among the normal, ordinary people. The reality is, is that people's musical tastes update over time, like your taste for all art, whether it's film, whether it's literature, um, whether it's music, it just changes over time. This idea that you want to fetishize some arbitrary selection of dates doesn't make any sense. Fe I'm so sorry. so if if you if uh, you consider if you consider high culture in a in a different category. What does high culture mean to you? Why is that music high culture? You don't know what today? great literature is? Well, what is the great the, the canon of great literature? Great No, Western no, 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 no. Let's let's talk about music. What do you, why what why is, do you think some music is high culture compared <laughs> to other music? I'm curious. You said what is high culture? <sighs> then I then I give you an example. And you say no, let's talk about music. Well, because we're talking high, about high music culture. and you are bringing it up in relation to music, so I want to talk about music. So tell me what does high culture music mean to you? I'm curious. High culture high culture is classical music. It's stuff like that. Why? What makes it high culture? What do you mean? What makes it high culture? You realize it's that every argument music, you're giving now, that in like the romantic music, era, that if you if you train your ear to listen to it, and it, you're, if you're, it, it's almost like eating food, right? If you spend your whole life eating spaghettios, you probably can't enjoy a, a, a better meal, right? Because your if palate. If this is the argument is that you want to make, you so realize... you have to train a man's palate. For classical music, in some cases, no, you don't. Most and classical, we don't do no, 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 that no. In this, this is in not this true. I encourage anybody right now listening to go and download any number of Mozart or even Haydn pieces. You can understand these and listen to these immediately. They're just boring. Do you think they're great? No, oh, they're boring. You find them boring? Okay. Of course. Compared to the I mean, type of music that we have available is, today, the selection the of instruments, they, our, 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 har our harmonic vocabulary has massively expanded compared to what they had in the 1800s <laughs> and in the 1900s. Yeah, of course. Massively expanded. So like some, some, some black guy talking fast over a four over four beat is considered massive expansion. Is, it, is every beat just Latin. a four? It, it, how, what do you think are the rhythms of most like classical songs? You, you talk about waltzes. Do you think the rhythms there in a waltz is complicated? Like what you're making what fun I'm of saying, a four over four beat. Like, wow, you've got three, four, and six, eight. Like, oh, it's so much more complicated. Well, like, what I'm saying is that what you say is an expansion. It, it's true that four over four beats were common. Uh, in classical music, but there's also different other other types, other types of tempo. The point I'm making is that cla within the classical realm, there are many different types of doing classical music. You know, how many times? I mean, why do you think rock music is like basically played out now? 
Like people don't listen to rock music anymore. What are you Part talking of it, about? Progressive rock had like a pretty massive upswing sure, in like the early 2000s. Not, sure, like, listen, listen, stop being pedantic. You know what I mean? I'm not being pedantic. You're just ra- making You turn it on the radio. Oh, you want to all right, look, 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 okay, look, sure, look. Sure. we can talk about music all show. And I actually didn't yeah. stop it because I'm entertained by this. Other people. Well, sure. I, I just feel like I, I'm just. I'm yeah. happy okay, that we we'll open. Finish, let's sure. I'm happy finish that we up o- this segment. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I'm just. Ahead. I'm happy that we open with this topic so that I kind of have like an understanding of how absolutely disingenuous like every other cultural argument is going to be. Like this. Like for anybody that's listening that has any musical background at all, everything you said is laughable. Like you talk about the necessity to train an ear to hear something. The amount of ear training required to follow like Coltrane's later pieces versus like fucking Mozart pieces is hilarious. Like you need oh, so God. much more ear training to follow any complicated jazz composition like the harmonies in that are almost impossible to follow versus classical music like that's hilarious all right now let me read these because they paid me to read them and then i'll let destiny since the open i did not expect a you know 15 minute discussion on jazz when i well i mean like they literally play mozart to babies and this guy's telling you you need to develop ear for it oh my god i I thought it was interesting that's why some people like oh what are we talking about jazz i mean honestly both you guys are fired up so why would i stop that Finally, I did have to stop it, though. All right, let's keep going. Gordzilla37 says, Striker 1, I'll watch the rest for laughs. Uh, Patrice O'Neill Groyper says, my rock came from blacks. Pensive Cowboy says, bets on where the random freakout I'll use uh, will start. King Porgy says, NB4, excessive use of wait, 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 dudes. Uh, Professor Eric says, this is awful. I disagree. I thought that was excellent, actually. Terry J says, hi, guest. Would you rather... Me- I'll, I'll get to that later. We're, we'll, we'll work that in later. I, I know what your question is. Nicholas Diorio says, what the fuck? This is so good. Yeah, I mean, that was my view. Uh, Unites the Goat says, Destiny is actually kicking his ass. LOL. Racist says, jazz music sounds like cats in a car wreck. Dave the Impaler says, metal is modern classic music. All that matters. Racist. Subscribe for a month. The real Tinchy, there we go. We got an agreement. The real Tinchy says, Striker is making me embarrassed to be right wing. Professor Eric says, Change the subject, Ralph. This is so stupid. I don't really think that's a stupid uh, argument that they had there, to be honest. Uh, Pensive Cowboy says, Reject Beethoven, embrace Gregorian Templar chants. Pensive Cowboy says, Hello, I'm your host, Rethan Alf. Welcome to NPR. (laughs) 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 It was more of an NPR type discussion there, I guess. Uh, United the Goat, uh, subscribe for a month. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Eric says the FBI isn't sending sending its best tonight. John John says uh, Hayden's rhythms are logical. Destiny is a moron. John John then says classical music is pure fucking logic. Destiny. Tyrone 88 says Mozart 2016 best selling CD. All right. Now, Destiny, uh, I'll mm. let you you. Uh, Interesting. Ask I, I, mean, I, I just want to point out that the ultimate irony of this entire last section about how elites are dictating what we want to listen to on the radio, when you're citing classical composers that literally these operas that you're talking about were commissioned by literal elites, literal royalty and noblemen for them to be sure. written and played. And you're talking like if right. anybody here is pushing a message from the elites, it would be somebody telling us to listen to an opera that a fucking king or a baron like literally commissioned from somebody to write for them. Sure, but the the point I was making, and I, I do want to, we can move on. Sure, we can move on. Please, but but Please. I will, I will, I will finish with this. What I meant by elites <laughs> is that the elites are the ones that control the radio stations, and they decide what what the people hear. And then those very elites go and they listen. To, they can go to the Philharmonic to go listen to Beethoven. Okay, I so, I will agree that, with that, that and that I shows, will concede that in the eighteen hundreds, um, the elites had less control of the radio stations. I will, I will concede to that. Oh, good, <laughs> good one. All right, go ahead, go ahead, Destiny. Now it's your turn to offer a query. Hopefully, not about jazz music, but uh, I, I enjoyed that section. So, um, I mean, we could talk about uh, what are your um, what are your economic positions. It sounds like you're you flirt with I, socialism I'm, a little, or what do we got here? Yeah, I'm a, I I can I am an anti capitalist, an anti capitalist. Yes. So how um, a nationalist? Nationalism and socialism are interchangeable and cannot exist without one another. Well, so th- that's absolutely not true. But um, well, for the sake of the argument, we'll, we can talk about socialism if you want. Um, so are, are you like a favor of like completely abolishing the profit motive? Do you want like the government to be in charge of central no. planning or like what I guess like what is your I'm uh, not trying to corny. I'm just curious. Like what, what is your ideal economy look like? I mean, I, I think that small businesses are OK. Uh, but I do think uh, command economies are, in, in retrospect, now starting to look more appealing. Especially now, we see how uh, China is able was able to weather the 2008 recession compared to America, which struggled to get out of it. Uh, you know, and even now with the coronavirus, you see how decisive and the, the central banks in China are, which are run by the government, in 
uh, having banks loan at zero interest to small businesses, prioritizing struggling families and so on. Uh, you know, then we look at what's happening in America. You get $1.5 trillion zero interest loan to Goldman Sachs and other, comp and other banks, private banks like that, who actually, it's no strings attached. They get this, this funny money and they can loan that money at whatever price they want. If it's a bear market, they are basically, they can retrench on credit like they did in 2008, which is why the, the recession lasted so long, basically. Uh, you didn't see any. Basically, what I'm saying is that in, in private, the private banking system is the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is privately owned also, giving zero interest money to these banks and hoping a couple dollars trickle down to the rest of us. And I don't think that's a that's a fair system or a functional system. And we see now with the problems with the supply chain uh, and things like the, the businessmen who are very unpatriotic in this country, uh, you know, there's lots of problems with capitalism, you know. Um, okay. Um, wow. Okay. So in, in terms of command economies looking more appealing, I don't think any command economy played out very successfully um, in the history of the world that I'm aware of. I think there were a couple, there's like, I don't know if people bring up like catatonia or some shit that have lasted for like a couple of years. Um, but command, China is definitely not a command economy. Like they have a market, a mixed market that responds to private incentives. The government is the owner of a lot of these businesses, but it's still very much yes. not a command economy. The government does not dictate which goods and services are produced. They respond to market incentives, which is a capitalist idea. Um, um, so, so China is, well, it would never if, be. If China, if if the Chinese government, oh, if if these companies, well, actually, wait, I'm sorry, hold on. You you said like seven things. I got to respond to them instead instead of letting you get away with every ridiculous thing you said. Um, the idea mm -hmm. that central banks in China are ran by the government, so they make loans at zero percent interest. I mean, the U.S. Federal Reserve has kept interest at historically low rates for like the past. They don't. Decade I didn't say well. that. The Chinese bank, the People's Bank, doesn't isn't loaning at zero percent interest. Okay, so uh, yeah, what, what was what is the point of bringing that up? The point of bringing that up is that the money the money they give out to underlings it has strings attached that they have to use it to to help people rather than than use it to to for whatever whatever they want. Oh sure, we do that in the United States. It's that's what our government budget goes towards. We don't dictate obviously what private companies do with their money, but that's because we run a capitalist economy, I guess. But I mean, we have Congress to dictate spending from the federal government. Um, you, you're talking about a $1.5 trillion no interest. Are you talking about the recent repo market thing in, in the United States? What, what, I, what I'm talking about is partially that but what i'm talking okay, about so real in general quick, i'm sorry I, I can't let is, you go because you, wait, wait, you said like seven things and if i let you go off then i've got like 20 more things to respond to. Right. so the recent 1.5 trillion dollar thing that wasn't funny money or random whatever loan that was the treasury providing cash liquid cash to, to yeah. financial institutions in exchange for treasury notes like okay. they're not just giving them money they're exchanging right. they're like cash them stock with money we, right. yeah but they're, they're trading it it's a secured it's collateralized debt it's a secured debt mm -hmm. Th that's not just nothing right that so that would be like the federal government giving me a hundred dollars and then me giving them back like a treasury note for a hundred dollars and right. then like it's in, a, in, at zero it's at zero percent interest it's a secured so debt it, every debt that even consumer debt is very very low interest if it's secure that's why our car yeah, loans higher than zero percent it can be sure i, I mean you can it get can, a it is well you can get a zero percent interest car loan everybody in the audience knows that those exist um you know you can get zero percent they exist but they're not uh, you know you know what's funny if if i was goldman sachs if i behaved uh -huh. financially like goldman sachs does i would not get a zero percent loan from anyone in my personal life if i use money like they that's do. that's because you're okay. an individual you're not a company you, you, like you have a fundamentally I'm different operation bank run, no, no, run you, by jews no, no, that's it, the it has nothing to do with jews and everything to do with your total lack of understanding well, of financial goldman markets sachs? it what, doesn't matter who runs goldman? goldman sachs we're not talking about the What's owner the no it doesn't it matter. matter it doesn't matter you're, you're pivoting oh, so hard matter. you're about to tear your acl okay calm down all right it has oh, nothing okay. to do with who's running the banks we haven't even gotten to the jews yet don't worry i'm sure we'll get there okay oh, we, we the will. idea of providing liquidity to banks okay <clears throat> by exchanging their treasury notes with actual cash so that they can Listen, continue I'm to, not to... disputing this i'm not wait, disputing wait, but you, well, you said well, one, oh, no 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 you said 1.5 trillion have, in funny money it's what, not what funny I, money I, it's a I, fundamental misunderstanding of this economic transaction what i'm what i'm disputing what the problem i have with the current system okay is that the federal reserve gives 0% interest cash to Goldman Sachs, but does not do it to average families. That's my problem. Okay. Why does Goldman say, why do we have to have Goldman Sachs as a middleman to loan to small businesses and to working families when we can just open up federal reserve banks 
and loan it to people directly. Why don't we just do that? Because our current understanding of the economy is that you can't just print and lend infinite money at 0% interest rate. Now, obviously, our economic- But you can to the, the Goldman Sachs. Okay. Yeah, you can you so you First can all, do it. I, I, I don't, I don't think, think I don't think, because the, these people have different jobs. In the it's not like Goldman Sachs is going out and buying and running car companies and paying. Have an what? Don't have an argument. Wait, you, hold on, hold on. You, you just said like thirty-five. You just said like thirty-five wrong things in a row. Wait, wait. Interest. Come on, saying, dude. You can't give out, you, dude. This is not a good you, face argument. You you're saying you can't give zero percent loan cash to ordinary people, but you can give it to investment banks to loan to ordinary people with usury. Why? Why is that? Do you, if you want, what we can spend like, we, if you want, we can, for that if other you than want, corruption. have you, well, I don't know, you run a blog on this. Have you ever talked to an actual economist that studies finance that can give you a reason on why these loans are working? Do you think it's just who some giant conspiracy and that normally, the, yes, I do who think cares? I think, I think you should care I if you're going to sit here ranting about it. Who cares what these phony baloney economists often in the pay, they work for foundations that take donations from Goldman Sachs, say to rationalize a fucking intuitively bullshit system. So, so I'm so, saying. I'll, I'll, so well, hold on, hold on, just so I can understand. So all the educated people around the world, anybody that studies central bank finance, all of these people are on the payrolls of the mysterious Jews, that's all the people that I study said, economics. Because there are many educated people that criticize this in ex the exact same way I do. There's a lot of different opinions when it comes to this practice there are some people that get lost in the in the web of semantics and, and oftentimes it's bullshit not, no 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 it's not of, it's not just semantic no, no 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 it's not just you can't just hand wave every explanation as semantics because it doesn't fit your weird conspiracy that jews are running the fucking world i didn't say that alone i you said literally that and in a conversation about finance you decided to bring up who owns goldman sachs when it's not I'm relevant saying, to the operation I'm of the saying. financial system you're trying to pivot so hard because you want to talk about jews that you won't even sit here and think for two seconds of your understanding of the financial system works the, the way that it sh like you're, how you're it not works. You're, see, you're you're attacking me i'm no no i'm not me, attacking you and you, you're not I, and you're I'm, not I'm actually not, you're no, not no. actually addressing you're not at. Let I'm me ask not a attacking very simple, you. I'm ask, literally bringing ask, up what you just said. Hold on. Let me ask you. Let me repeat. Let me let me repeat my question. Let me repeat my okay, question very slowly. Okay. Repeat your question. Very slowly. You know. Grab your stress ball. Uh, here. Why is it? Again, give me an answer. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the Federal Reserve can provide cash liquidity at zero percent interest to Goldman Sachs, but can't provide it? To ordinary people because ordinary people that? do not have the collateral to back up that debt and cannot pay back those massive sums of as of money in as short a time period as massive financial institutions like goldman sachs can a person can't hand over their car like get a car and then pay back that loan in three months if you look at this 1.5 trillion dollar repo thing that you just recently brought up the timelines on these loans are incredibly fucking short it's done for liquidity not so that they can just take it and invest in banks they have to pay these back these massive trillion dollar or, or more for individual institutions hundreds of billions or tens of billions they have to pay back these loans in a matter of months an average person you could probably i guess if you wanted to get a loan like that you could but you would default on it every time an average person can't take a loan out for two hundred fifty thousand dollars and pay it back in three months like goldman sachs can like collateral well, then like, why, if 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 goldman sachs is so great with their money and so responsible why do they need a 1.5 trillion dollar cash injection from the government because why because if we can have a government that helps us weather great financial difficulties. Why You're not answering the question. I why am did, answering why the question. Goldman it's not complicated. Act? Because we wouldn't expect every single business to why pay themselves. Why don't they have cash? Because why holding cash, cash reserves is a detriment to the economy. Nobody wants to just hold on to cash. We want that money to be lent. The whole reason why the Fed is injecting liquidity into these institutions is because we don't want them to hold on to cash. We want that money to be, we, we, it's called the velocity of money, right? We want it to be circulating in the economy. I don't want Goldman Sachs to have 10 trillion fucking dollars in its reserves. I want that lent out to American businesses and to American people to buy if, shit. If you, if, you, if you want money circulating in the economy, because the point I'm making, you're, you're saying that people don't have collateral, they're not going to pay it back. What I'm saying is, instead of using Goldman Sachs as a middleman that charges interest, they charge interest on their loans. If you look at credit card interest, it could range wildly depending on your credit history. They charge interest on their loans, right? So what I'm saying is, why doesn't the Federal Reserve for people that want to that 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 are that can take them take that money and and people that need it especially to get back on their feet why doesn't the federal reserve 
give it to people directly at zero percent interest you the, know a lot of people that that, that are in I, consumer I, debt mm -hmm. are actually fighting every month <clears throat> mm -hmm. just to pay the interest yeah okay the, the fact that so you would let's take the, the interest no, 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 out no, no, of the, oh the equation God. and let's actually have a credit system that is fair because it's not fair that Goldman Sachs, when it, if, if, if your point is that we need money circulating in the system, what better way to do it than to loan it to small businesses, than to loan it to people at directly at 0% interest? What better way than to do that? I've if already, that's the I've, real So point. I've already answered this question. If you don't understand the difference between trading liquid cash for a treasury note versus credit card interest that is totally unsecure if you don't understand maybe for people in the audience that are wondering why is my credit card interest rate 24 percent but my car note is six percent or five percent why is my home mortgage three and a half percent the reason is because those debts are secured by underlying assets when goldman sachs is trading money the federal reserve all of that debt is collateralized and it's backed up by underlying assets. They pay this debt back sometimes in a matter of days, sometimes in 12 hours. A human that buys something, a normal consumer that buys something on a credit card at 24% interest is doing so because if they default on that debt, then you're shit out of luck. I can't go to a person that owes me 10,000 in credit card debt and, and what, go to, go into their house and steal their, what, their My Little Pony collection or like a computer desk or a, or, or a monitor they bought? Like, no, that debt is unsecure. The types of loaning that are done to financial institutions is fundamentally different than the types of loans that are done to individuals. This is basic finance. Like, I, I can't, like, I, this is not worth talking about. We should move on to the next topic. Like, if you don't understand the difference between right. a credit card loan why, and, and, why, and a, a repo market, did, like, did, these are fundamentally Gold, different why things. Why did Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, you know, because because the, the, the kind of the kind of red herring you're using it's is not that a red herring. It's finance 101. But go the, ahead. The, sorry. The, the, the kind of the kind of logic you're using is that yes, people, you know, you you might not get paid back so on the problem is why did morgan stanley and goldman sachs in the 2008 crisis especially uh, why did they need the government to stabilize them clearly they're not so stable in terms of their obligations either so why is it that they can they can do you know goldman sachs is notorious around the world for its quote exotic financial instruments you know, it was basically a bunch of fucking really dirty scheming stuff going on and that's not just my opinion this yeah. is something welcome shared by to many derivative people. markets of course sure yeah so why is it that knowing all of this the government look again gives them liquidity at zero percent interest knowing how irresponsible they are with this money and not ordinary people who may be in some cases just as irresponsible but in other cases will actually pay their stuff back you know there there are studies on for example microfinance loans which i find repulsive on an ethical level but there are studies that poor people in, in you know working class people tend to be better at paying these small loans off than Goldman Sachs is with uh, Goldman Sachs is with its with its obligation. This is a Not horrible just example, Sachs. given that you brought up the 2008 bailouts. Those were paid back to the federal government with interest. So you're just That's wrong fine. on that. First, That's well, no, no, no. But no, no, why can no, they no. get bailed out? So, can a okay, person sure. behind so, on their mortgages who's unemployed get a, a, a special loan at zero percent interest to pay their mortgage until they get back on their feet? Sure. And, and so able people, to pay yeah, back so zero that, interest yes. back. So that no. happened. Yes. That was called the Home Affordable Refinance Program, HARP. It was done under Obama. Sure. I think it ended a few years ago. But many yeah, people, people could still qualify. Were sure. Many people, many were still people were because on. there was a huge housing bubble. Of course, sure. Oh my ah, God. It's like, okay. no, no, no. You can't say, ah, when you just like, you happen to stumble into a point that was marginally correct after fucking drunkenly hammering at like every incorrect point you could on the store on your way to the I mean, bathroom. Okay. So hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Chill, chill, chill. You know. So, okay. So there's two things going on here. Okay. You, you've got two separate questions that you're like, you're confusing with the other. So one is, should Massive financial institutions that are the backbone of our economy be allowed to partake in speculative markets that might be damaging to the overall economy? This is an amazing question. And in my opinion, the answer is probably not. It seems really fucking unhealthy. Then the second okay. question you're asking is, is why do large businesses need a cash injection from the government to ensure liquidity in times of crisis? Well, that's, this is actually that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying why not large businesses? OK, because Goldman Sachs actually is even with the listen, I'm no fan of corporations, but the corporations got to go through Goldman Sachs to get the cash at interest. And, and if you know anything about how these heavily indebted corporations operate, they are usually just paying off the interest every month. 
So this is a this is what do you, a what do you mean by just part? No, 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 no. What are, you, what are you talking about? This is not how the, 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 the world of corporate the, loans the, works. The, the burden of the interest on their debt is what a lot of it, it causes more problems. It just gets them deeper I'm, I'm sorry, in the hole. We, so no, we, we would have to like we, we would have to like I don't want to like put you on the spot, but like corporate debt. It feels like you're doing this really common thing that I see a lot of lefties do. Where you're, you're conflating corporate debt with personal debt. Corporations use debt and leverage no, debt to become you. You absolutely are. Corporations can hold debt on their books. Sometimes corporations even even take on debt to no. do like like stock buybacks or something. Like a corporation can leverage yes, debt to make exactly. money in far different ways than an individual can. If an individual tells you, "I've got twenty thousand in debt and you know my my annual income is sixty thousand a year or whatever like that's really fucking bad sometimes corporations mm -hmm. that have taken on a lot of debt are actually seen as more favorable because they're using that debt to finance like larger capital expansion this comparison that's of like actually not true that they, absolutely using, is true it's they're more, using their most corporations are actually using their debt to like you said stock buybacks that's the big one in the which last is couple good of years. yeah it, yeah, it's great. Look at the stock market and look at Boeing shaking their coffee cup outside the what is government. The, what does the current pandemic have yeah, to do great with idea. Wait, wait, what does the current pandemic have to do with stock buybacks? Uh how about the diving stock market? <laughs> so that was because of stock buyback? I thought that stock buybacks were supposed to artificially inflate stock value. Why are they going down? Dude, why are you being facetious? I'm not being facetious. You just have no idea how finance works. You thought you could have this conversation. It's hilarious. I'm, I'm telling you what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you. Is are we going to talk about the oil prices? These corporate, these corporations, these corporations have like Boeing have been infl have been using the their their debt powered machinery, their debt powered finances, okay, unbalanced books to buy their own stock so that it's more. Uh, it, it's of higher value on the stock market artificially it bubbles up how is that artificial that, because if you're buying your own stock and you're you're engaging in that kind of speculative activity you're not doing wait, anything productive how is that, that's literally you're the not opposite building of speculative. anything wait, wait. that's because there are no good investments to make that's pretty common of large companies sometimes if there's, there's no, no good if there's no good invest i mean how why if there's no good investments to make why are they getting in debt for a variety of reasons. Well, right now it's because airline travel has been slashed by like fucking 80%. Do you think there's any other uh, industry that could sure. survive that? But they were doing this. They were, listen, yeah. they were making record profits. They were getting no, into they're more, not. more debt. No, 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 no. The, this is the not true. The airline industry, it's the, not various, true. various industries got the Trump tax cut. They got more money than before. They had more money than before, and they still were getting into massive debt. Uh, you see this also with the oil shale and all that, getting into massive debt and doing what with the debt? Mergers, buybacks. It's parasitical activity that benefits the shareholders but doesn't produce anything so for our country. So by definition, what you just said and, doesn't make and sense. The second, and, increase, the second, wait, wait, and the second, and the second, there's a little oh bump in the, in the financial markets like we're having now. There's a huge, you know, there's trillions of dollars being wiped out. You think this right? is a little bump in the market right now? Well, you think this pandemic? Yeah, no, no, hold on. I just I, want to hear you say that again. You think this is a little bump in the market when why, entire why, fucking why states? Why are you? Why you know exactly what I meant? No, I, I know what you mean. You know, no, no, I'm not being. To... Can you stop saying every time I call you out on some retarded shit you say that I'm being facetious? You're very. You, you know what? You're fucking. If you want to fucking engage in name calling, like I said, I didn't call go, you any names. Go, I said go, you're saying go, really go. dumb shit. Go like, have your your go have your cookie and your glass of milk and get your girlfriend to change a nappy and we can have a, an adult conversation. I'm who, trying who, to talk to you like a, like a civilized human being, no, and you're acting out like no, you know no, why, why okay. you call everything. No, that's retarded. <laughs> you no, know, listen. Well, because I'm, I'm saying, asking you questions and instead of just giving me simple answers, you have to go off into all these like massive like conspiracy theories. How, no, like, because no, no. it's not oh a massive God. conspiracy theory. What I what I meant, if you want me to be extra clear. An extra yeah, definitive. I, I do. So can you tell me how a stock buy when is there's a, bad when there's a That's bump, what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. When there's, when there's a problem in the stock market, mm -hmm. all that debt you got into to buy your own stock so that you can give your shareholders and various finance capitalist speculators bigger profits without doing any work or taking any risks uh, in the short term. When you do that, when there's a problem with the stock market, these companies like Boeing is doing now, they go to the taxpayer to bail them out. So first, okay, 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 sure. Okay, so let me go all the way back because holy shit, there was so much said here that was just so fucking wrong. Uh, so just, firstly, just give me one, one, the, I'm sorry, just one second, just one second, hold on.
Okay. How um, you doing, Ralph? I'm go gonna ahead. fucking kill myself. Holy shit! This is like well, every economically uninformed socialist I've ever talked to. It makes me want to fucking jump off a cliff. Oh my god! I'm just the friendly host. I don't know. We'll see. I know. I Speaking of economics, I think it's time to read the the super chat. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Okay. All right, okay. So, Okay, well, let me read these, and you guys can have a final word on you know each side there, and then wait, wait, no, no, wait, hold record. on, before we do this, Rex, because there's so much. Okay, go ahead, go okay. ahead, go. You know what? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah go okay. Ahead. So That's let fine. me back all the way up. So when you say, why do major institutions need financial injections or cash injections or liquidity injections from the Fed or whatever in order to to stay afloat? The reason is because we want to keep our economy moving. We don't want every single business hoarding money or not loaning money or sitting on piles of money in anticipation of a massive worldwide pandemic. That would be catastrophic to the entire economy. We want to keep the economy moving. We want to keep workers employed. We want to keep hopefully wages going up, hopefully cost of goods down. This is why we want companies to generally operate on, on, a, on an understandable margin, which does doesn't mean preparing for a worldwide pandemic constantly. That's why if a worldwide pandemic does happen, we look to the federal government to say, hey, can you give our businesses a little bit of a hand to keep them afloat? This is like one of the most no-brainer policy decisions in the world. This is literally a win-win-win-win policy decision. If the government gives a cash injection to these companies, it helps the companies not go underwater. It helps the workers not get fired or laid off. It helps the federal government or the taxpayer because those loans are often paid back with interest. And it helps consumers that can continue to buy products for cheaper costs than they would if all of these companies were to go under and the cost of goods either increases or these goods disappear completely. So the idea hey, that the... Whoa, whoa, hold on. You said so much Oh. Okay, so the oh. idea that it's bad for the government to ensure liquidity, like, what, what are you going to argue against, like, FDIC insurance next or whatever? Like, the idea that it's bad that the government is going to provide liquidity in times of crises for businesses and that businesses should somehow just be ready to take a 50% cut in business on a whim would be so catastrophically destructive to our finance markets and our entire economy that it's laughable to even suggest that. Firstly, secondly, no, secondly, this, no, 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 stop. Not, I can't even finish. I haven't even right. finished getting through, getting through all the wrong shit you said. So stock buybacks are prefer. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Hold on. Firstly, airlines are not these massively profitable industries. Um, I went ahead and I shot the, 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 the last like couple decades of profits or whatever, or the last 15 years of American airlines. Um, they were literally just profitable. I think like five or six years ago. And yeah, they were posting decent profits, but the profit oh. of like 7 billion when your revenues are 40 plus billion. Billion, those margins are generally pretty thin. The margins for airlines are very thin in the United States, and they always have been. The quickest way to become a millionaire in the United States is to have a billion dollars and buy an airline. There's a reason why these things go out of business all the time. And the idea that there's some massively profitable company is just not true. It's not supported by any data whatsoever. Nobody ever seriously makes this argument ever. For a second, okay, I hold on. That oh, okay, that's great. That's great. Got, you can come back. You can come back. Tax cuts, but go ahead. You can go back and do all of this when, yeah, when I'm done this. Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Also, this idea that stock buybacks are some parasitic activity when, by definition, a stock buyback is returning money to the shareholders that invested in your company is literally the exact opposite of a parasitic activity. A parasitic activity would be a company making a lot of money and sitting on that money and it can't do anything else with it in the economy, being a parasite with that money that's just sitting there. A better idea would probably be to buy back stocks, return money to shareholders, and let those shareholders take those dollars and invest them in other companies that can invest those in profitable projects. Now, if you want to talk about something like, well, when Trump gave those big tax cuts, the only thing companies did with it was do buybacks instead of investing in their companies. I agree. Those tax cuts were fucking stupid. But that's a criticism of the tax cuts themselves, not stock buybacks in general. Any company that reaches a sufficient size or economy of scale is either going to be paying back a lot of its profits in stock buybacks or, if we make those illegal, in the form of dividends to their shareholders. If you invest in a company, you want to make money on it, obviously. This is true of every single investment you could ever possibly make. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Let, 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 me, let me just say quick, a quick thing. Uh, Ralph, and then that's we can fine. move on. Yeah. Uh, here's here's my response. So this is this is a fundamental difference in our values, Destiny. You you have you believe the shareholders, as long as they're getting dividends, then that's functional. That's fine. I don't believe that. I Never think our country. That. You said, hey, the, they're doing what they have to do to deliver. I'm just explaining basic shareholder. finance to you right now. Right. I never said that. Hold on. Let me just say one last thing. Let me just say one last thing. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, let him go. Uh, Destiny, Destiny admitted before that there's nothing. He said it. His words, these companies have nothing to invest in. Your words. So if they have nothing to invest in, how does giving them more money raise wages or improve the uh, uh, more people with jobs or create a better economy for everyone? It doesn't. That is the fundamental difference in what you and I think. Sure, it does help the shareholders. It does help the, the Boeing CEO 
whose planes are literally f- fucking dropping from the sky get a massive bonus in a year where he, he, he he's retired from the from the, the position. So the point I'm making is that I don't agree with this system, and I think it should be changed. That's no. the fundamental disagreement. That's all. Yeah. So I know. Let me wait, read wait, the... oh, wait, just one quick thing. I'm so sorry, no. Ralph. I love you. You're gonna have so many. Super gonna have... You're gonna have so many super chats. Okay. <laughs> so just real quick, when you said this is where you fundamentally disagree, I literally agree with you. I don't know if you didn't hear me or you didn't understand that, but I literally said if companies have nothing to invest in, giving them massive tax cuts is a really dumb idea. Very critical of Trump for doing that. If you're giving tax cuts to these companies and all they're doing is returning value to shareholders, of course you wouldn't expect a tax cut to raise wages. Wages like labor, that's a cost of doing business. Giving more money to a company to raise wages makes absolutely no fucking sense whatsoever. That's trickle-down economics. The Republicans push it as some weird supply-side meme. It's dumb as fuck. If you want to wa- yeah, raise wages... Agree. Yeah, sure. Well, I never disagreed on that. But there's a big difference between needing to provide liquidity to companies in times of crisis versus giving them tax cuts in order for them to just like send well, the money back to shareholders, sure. which makes my, no sense. My solution to that would be to nationalize Boeing. The, if the government is willing to... If, if, if this company continues repeatedly to be begging for bailouts, for, for liquidity, then perhaps... It shouldn't be owned by people that give themselves massive bonuses when their planes are flying out, dropping down from That's the sky. That's awesome. So why don't we just have that right. conversation about nationalizing companies rather than making all these weird, horrible finance right. arguments that make I no was sense? Critiquing, I was critiquing capitalism. You're not critiquing okay. right. it. You're just making a bunch of right. wrong statements. That's like being critical sure. of human biology because we have 17 fingers. It doesn't okay. make sense right. if your critiques are so right. wrong. Right. Now, we're an hour in, so let me read these and then I'll let... Striker, bring up his his topic here. Now, there's several topics. I don't know. We'll see what comes next. It'll be up to you, Striker. Let me read these though. Uh, it has been a fiery conversation so far. I think that that's uh, an understatement. Uh, Terry J mentioned for me to ask the question. Y'all yeah, ask that question later. Uh, Sands Wine subscribe monthly. Thank you, sir. Uh, paramedic says Parabellum. Uh, let's see. Unru uh, with the diamond didn't say anything. Quam bomb eighty seven says I'm I'm gonna watch a Dame replay. All right, enjoy that. Base Anglo says is Destiny willing to debate Patrick Casey? I yeah, they I would say yes because we were trying to set it up at one point. Um, maybe we'll try to set it up again. I don't know. Pinky Culture says uh some some kind of uh, money from the Middle East. Uh, money printer goes brr. Uh, save Western civilization says round one was destiny round two, clearly going to striker digital pimp says fuck striker for making me agree with destiny King Porgy uh, or Porgy says round one, destiny round two striker with destiny Spurging. When Robert 32 says Kelly Miller is trash. Uh, Bruni strong says, why would a personal loan from the federal government have to be the same amount as to Goldman Sachs Porsche? person since destiny's on switch i'll be careful there uh destiny is a big meanie quote eric striker the real tinchy says adderall invented by germans super pill wignats mad <laughs> that made me laugh uh robert 32 says destiny send a ninja to ralpho bet you won't not bet he won't either king 4g says how to logic with destiny red bull and adderall robert 32 says olive oil economy is through the roof arcade outpost says uh, that those people in the Middle East power being taboo is testament to it. I'm sure we'll get to those people in the Middle East uh, here here in a moment. Uh, now, let me refresh these because there are some uh, on stream elements uh, talking about peaceful sunsets. I won't read that one. Eric DeMamp says, why does Eric Stryker still refer to himself as Eric Stryker? Obviously, I'm not going to read the name that you're putting out there. Uh, and then I'll, I'll leave that there, but thank you for the contribution. Uh, Sancho 13 says, Destiny argues in bad faith is a proponent of incest and twincest argues on the side of eating shit and drinking piss doesn't bathe with his greasy hair and love of dirty tricks. Why give him attention? Well, I mean, I like him as a guest. That's Wait, what, what is the difference uh, between incest and twin cess? Wouldn't one be a subset of the other? Like if somebody that supports yeah, incest right. probably supports <laughs> twin cess by default. Okay. Really. Plus we've had this conversation. Yeah, well, bang for your buck there company. on that dono. Okay. <laughs> Blue division says, so Valsh was dis- scared to debate a real socialist. So, uh, he sent someone else and said, look, let's not bring Vouch into this. We have a whole subset of Vouch. I'm sure everybody knows what happened last weekend. Uh, so we'll leave that there. But thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one says, can we please pass to the phase when the Muslim wignats on wheelchairs get to occupy Wall Street? Also, I found a Brazilian nationalist who's willing to come over to talk about the situ- situation down there. Well, yeah, email me. I'll talk to a Brazilian nationalist. Uh, let's see. All you guys should take a modern arts course. You'll learn about why and how some arts and media like music has changed. You would understand why certain things are considered high art, uh, why we don't go out in waves to listen to 1600s folk music. Actually, I didn't know that your major was music, Destiny. I, that was that was yeah. knowledge to me. Uh, I do now, though. Kex for Kavanaugh says, can't force a man who can't tell the difference between 
Uh, Black, God, why do they? Black.com and Wagner to appreciate art. Strike hitting <laughs> his stride, forcing Destiny to shill for bankers. Most Americans want to, I won't read that, but uh, <laughs> don't like. Uh, what's more productive, loaning to new families or Goldman speculation? Blue Division says, Striker, stop being civil with this person. Destiny keeps cutting you off. It's obnoxious. Now, Striker, it's your time, sir. Go ahead. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about... Uh, I know Destiny has been reading a lot of historical stuff. We'll get to that later, but let's talk about nuts and bolts here. Uh, so, what you know, I I'm a proponent of total immigration restriction to all Western countries. Um, I from I'm, I'm guessing from from the series of opinions you have that you're you're for mass immigration. Am I right about that, uh, Mister Destiny? Uh, not generally. I'm like I'm for immigration as long as it makes economic sense. I guess as long as like. Yeah, I mean, within reasonable restrictions. I mean, I, I'm not going to have any race quotas or whatever. If I, I don't know where you're going with it, but well, what, what, what? Th there is no economic sense to immigration. Well, how, There's no need for immigration in the United States right now. That's our, our unemployment is literally at three point. Our, our unemployment is literally the lowest it's ever been in the history of the United States. It's at three point five percent. Like businesses are hiring at. You believe like, that number? You believe that number? You think you think only three percent of people in this country are out of work? You really think that? That's that's not what the U three unemployment stands for. I'm sorry, you're going to cite the U six like I've never heard of it before. We can pretend that like there's. Well, a then meaningful... why do you use that? Why do you use the fake statistic rather than the well, real? Well, because one? that's a really good question, you know. Yeah. And if we were to wander <laughs> yeah. in, well, yeah, yeah exactly. no, that's a really great you're question. No, I'm not being disingenuous. It's a very difficult question for economists to ask. There's a lot of different ways to keep track of unemployment. For instance, do we count young people that are under the age of 18 but could still technically work but would have to do it at restricted hours? Do we count older people that have willingly left the workforce? Do we count people that are collecting social security but are still working it's a really hard do we count people that are not really working for looking for work do we count people that are discouraged from looking for work? that's a really complicated question it's funny that you're going to sit here and pretend like it's got such an obvious answer when it's one of the most hotly debated things in economics and it's one of the reasons why the federal well, government my, keeps my, like seven different numbers on unemployment my point my point, my point is that your point was incorrect it's not simple the answer isn't immigration that's my point. okay that's fine but the the u3 unemployment which is widely regarded as one of the better metrics for how we should figure unemployment is 3.5 percent it's lower than it ever has been in the history of all of unemployment and the u6 unemployment which is maybe another one that you want to use which includes discouraged workers is seven percent which is also lower than what we would consider most There's frictional employment an undercount because so, it's not counting people that are going on disability people it, it that does are... that's that's literally why these other forms of unemployment tracking exist you can look at labor force participation rate you can look at the yeah. u3 u4 u5 or u6 you can look at any measure you want striker and it's all going to tell you the same thing furthermore, furthermore, furthermore why, yeah. isn't the <laughs> why isn't the unemployment rate zero and and if the unemployment rate's not zero mm -hmm. uh why do we need more immigration so the, so the unemployment rate isn't zero because some level of frictional unemployment is considered necessary for an economy to function. You want businesses to be able to hire people and you want people to be able to apply to businesses for jobs. Um, economists consider ideal unemployment to be about five and a half percent, anywhere from five to six percent, depending on which. Is that ideal for the people out of work? That's ideal for the people in the businesses. Yeah, the big people in business. Yeah, and that's not who we should be prioritizing. We should be prioritizing the, the, the average people in this country. Yeah, prioritizing not, not the average business. people in the country doesn't mean zero percent. I don't care if I don't care if if, if a business needs a hundred million Mexicans to fucking work for cheap. I don't care about that. Well, you know, but you the, do the care if poor thing. people can't afford to buy all their food from Trader Joe's or from some seventeen dollars for a gallon of milk store. You know, lower cost of goods is actually important to a lot of people that can't afford to buy. You know, the most expensive shit they can in the United States. Not only are lower cost of goods well, important. How, how people, come? How come food is affordable in Japan where there's no immigration? Japan has a, has a totally different style of government and has a whole bunch Not of problems. Not really. It's a liberal democracy with a capitalist economy. What are you talking about? It's the same economy. It's literally a country that was occupied and founded by the United States. So why this is, is it this is the weirdest non sequitur I've ever heard in my entire cool. life? Japan literally has a one party system and has some of the highest cost of living in the entire world. That's really it what has, you think the, the United States of America so, should so, go to? So, so do many. So do many cities in America that have the most immigrants, L.A., New York. These places have some of the highest cost of living in the world and they're full of immigrants. So what are you talking about? Uh, why would I compare L.A. to Japan? Because it has a high cost of living, and there's many millions of people living there. I can move there's, an hour out of L.A. And I can move one hour out of, out of L.A. and rent like a four-bedroom house for $2,500 $2, $2, a month. What does that have to do with what I'm saying? Because I don't know why you're comparing the literal most expensive places to live in the I'm, United I'm States to the totality of other countries. State, it's mind-numbingly fucking stupid. 
the, the, the state of California, the cities in the state of California are some of the most expensive on the planet. You and some of the a, cheap, a, there are very cheap cities to live in in California as well. Have you ever been to Central California oh, sure. or Northern California? Like, oh, yeah, those, those are lovely places. Uh, what I'm oh, saying so you're saying is, the only non you're, you're saying the most lovely places are the ones with all the immigration? <laughs> I don't know if that's the road you want to go no. down there, dude. Are, are, what, what part of Central California are you talking about? What what place in particular? I, there are places in Central California. I don't know. Nobody knows them because nobody wants to go there because people want to be in L.A. where all the immigrants are, surprisingly enough, or San Diego, yeah. or up north in San Francisco, or San Jose. Like the, the the point I'm making here is that a lot of those the the very very cheap places are full are full of like basically illegal Mexicans in, in parts of Central California. Wait, so, the, wait, the, I thought the, I thought you said the most expensive places were the ones that had high immigration. Are you saying the cheap places are the ones with high immigration? What about Texas and Arizona, where the cost dude, of living you're, is cheaper? You're, 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 you're being you're being let, let me let me explain this very slowly so you can't please because be almost everything it. you said contradicts itself. Okay. Go for it. So, no, no, no. Okay, it's a lot easier in a blog let, post, I'm sure. Let, let me explain it slowly. Okay, okay, go for it. I'm ready. So, so countries that have very low rates of immigration have affordable food. Poland, Japan, Hungary. People there don't starve. People there can afford food. They have no immigrants. Okay, in America. The, the, the places with some of the most densely, dense concentration of immigration have the highest rates of poverty and yet also the most high, uh, uh, the high prices of virtually everything. Everything is more expensive in L.A. Everything is more expensive in New York City. If you move out to, I don't know, Pennsylvania, where there are very few immigrants, everything is half the price. So why is that? If what you're saying is true. So America has affordable food. I don't know if you'd know that or if you think that all food in America is unaffordable. I don't know what comparing the affordability of food is in other countries is relevant to the affordability of food in America. Um, and also, Very relevant because if, if you're saying immigration means cheap food and I show you a country that has no immigration and also has cheap food, then Japan is not is an example it. of that, though, when you used it as an example. Japan is some of the high. Japan's cost of living and economy are so much trouble. They're actually begging for immigrants now. Japan has well, opened sure, itself up to immigration. If you go to a small town in Japan, it's cheaper than Tokyo. You're talking about the big cities there. I can go if to big go cities to... In, in Texas. I can go to Austin. I can go to Dallas. These are places with a lot of immigrants that also have really low cost Austin of living. Austin is insanely expensive. And no, Dallas it's is not. getting up Compared there. to a place like L.A., absolutely not. Well, not compared to L.A., but it's definitely. Austin is amongst the most expensive parts to live in. in in Texas is because of many reasons, not just immigration. maybe in Texas, but compared to the rest of the U.S., Austin is fairly cheap. OK, well, you, you, you made a point. You, you said that having uh, a, an entire class of, of basically of serfs, uh, illegal immigrant serfs working for wages for, below. Can you stop saying I've never below said, I've never said illegal work. immigrants. We're talking about immigrants. We're talking about illegal immigrants. You have that conversation. Oh, who do you think is picking your, your lettuce, bro? You think you think it's it's people with citizenship? Those are people. We're, we're, we're pivoting. That we're pivoting, are pivoting. This is a big pivot. You know, Do, I, I, if you want to talk about this country, but they're hideously exploited. Uh, agricultural uh, labor in this country is some of the most exploited in 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 the in the of all the sectors, and it's because the people doing it are illegal immigrants from Mexico that don't have any rights, and also they 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 uh they work for very cheap. So okay, I agree with you on that point. I'll concede we should have amnesty for all the illegals. Okay. Yeah, What's that's your next exactly okay. what I think. gotcha. I agree with that. But also illegals and legal immigrants no, you are two separate send them groups home of and people. They can fight their they can fight their 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 banks that, at, at, in their country and have a, a better society. So that that's serf slave labor doing. then should be white people in the U.S. or do we like get the other? No. How about how about this? How about this? Uh -huh. One, you use machines. And two, you pay you pay uh, agricultural labor what it's actually worth, what it's actually worth. You know, it's so interesting. I saw uh, an article about the, the Mississippi chicken plants they had, the, the meat packing and all that. Remember, there was an ice raid there. And in the 1960s, people in those plants made more, like almost like when adjusted for inflation, significantly more money an hour. I can't think of the, the exact number at the moment. I can pull it up. Significantly more money an hour. Uh, in fact, uh, the guy who wrote Fast Food Nation wrote about this. Um, wow. What's his name? Let me, let me look this up. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's, he's, he, I mean, you can say, wow, but he, <laughs> I mean, we're he, he, talking about chicken machines in Mississippi. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So this guy, he's a, he's a journalist who studies these things, Eric Schlosser. He wrote that. He's not Jewish, is plant, he? And the, 
I don't know. I mean, is that relevant to you? I don't know. I just, whew, I hope not. I'm not sure if he's trustworthy. Okay. But go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So, you brought it up earlier with so, Goldman Sachs. I'm just curious so, if he's Jewish now. I just want to make sure we're, we're being consistent on when we yeah, care I mean, about Jewish people. Know, I'm, not, I'm not some, I'm not, I know you have like this caricature of me <laughs> in your mind, but I'm not some like reflexive bigot. I, if some I mean, Jew anybody says that like, true, I'll, I'll anybody that him. brings up Jews in an unprovoked manner, you, it sets you know, off a lot me, of red flags for me, me, dude. Let, let me, let me get Sorry, go back, back to the chicken factories. Go ahead. So people, pe Americans that work there made more money, significantly more money were out for, the, for, the, for the very tough work mm -hmm. than illegal aliens that were raided by ICE were making last year. Sure. And so my, my point with that is that, you know, maybe a, a pound of chicken is, is worth a little more. How do you, what is something worth? How do you determine that? I'm super curious when you say what it's actually worth. Uh, is this like one of those open ended? Or are you like a um, um, Mises guy or no, something? So the, or the, like, I don't know if you realize. So you've done it. You, you did it. So earlier, I don't. I didn't forget. You did this with high culture as well. You you, you drop these really loaded terms. Where you're begging the question. I think your audience you know, knows what you mean, but you don't I actually mean, have. Wait, wait. You don't know. You, no, no, you no, no. don't know the difference no, no. between a black man and a white man. How am I going to expect you to differentiate between Mozart and Kanye West? Well, I, I can differentiate it because I have the educational if, background if, to do so. Firstly, no, secondly, I can tell you the difference a black man and a white man. They look different. If you have no no starting point for reason, how can I talk to you in in a manner? That that requires logic. The, the if starting, you, you temporarily can't, suspend yeah, so logic you can't in order use, to try and, use, and win a, a, a tie sure. in an argument. So you can't I mean, you can't can use words like logic when you're literally begging the question at every point. You never you never define what high culture meant earlier. I let you get away with it because I don't care, right? Well, but now but now okay. you're telling me maybe you're you're giving me a prescription. You're telling me something that ought to be. You're telling me that maybe we should pay agricultural labor what it's actually worth, implying that right now we're paying it less what are, than what it's what worth. Are people, so I'm curious what, what, are, what is it worth to you? What, what is it worth? Why can't you? Yeah, well, what how is do it you worth? how do you decide? Okay, yeah. Let, let me give you some 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 very you know you, you know Mister Mister Finance One Hundred and One. Let me give you okay, a go for it. Economy One Hundred and One. Okay. The price of labor <laughs> Shut the is fuck what up, bro. people what 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 people will take to do a job. Okay. Okay. And Americans, because Americans have families here, legal aliens usually, not always, and I, I'm just going to be very, very specific and clear here so you don't get a way out. Thank you. Legal aliens, not always, but many times, are single men mm -hmm. who live, for example, in the agricultural industry, they live in these kind of barracks that these, these companies' agribusiness puts up for them. Okay. They live together. They have a much lower standard of living because they're saving up dollars to send back to their country. Again, that's money that the, the, our economy loses, by the way. Many, many. We billions. don't lose that money. It comes back to the United States. This also has to do with like finance, but I can Ow. explain that later if you want. So when we buy products or when we ship USD to other countries, that USD has to make its way back to the United States in the forms of purchasing goods or services or in the forms of capital investment. So for instance, we talk about like the trade deficit with China or we talk about um, it's not reparations, it's repartitions. There's, there's a name for the repatriation. Repatriation. Repatriation, yes, yeah, the money yes. that you send overseas, yes. when that USD exists in other countries, especially because it's a, like a federal res or the global reserve currency, that USD generally makes its way back to the United States in the forms of purchasing goods and services. Any other economy that's holding a lot of USD because of the way that governments work can't pay taxes in that currency, so it has to bring that USD back to the US to invest or buy things. So for instance, our giant trade deficit with China, oftentimes when we buy things from China, that money makes its way back to the US in the form of investments or in the form of purchase of goods and services. Who gets those profits though? Uh, from, from, you're from, asking. From, a you're asking. Well, a from, well, hold on. Hold on. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I understand. So I understand that you just got an answer that you totally weren't ready for. Now we can run down to try to find where the Jews no, get paid I off the end of this. About, However, I just I, all I I don't need. No, 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 no. Listen, stop, stop, stop. stop. I don't. I don't. I don't. I, let's chill. Wait, wait, yeah. I, I don't need to answer. I don't need to answer your extended trying to figure out like how you could possibly be right here. I'm just telling you that when USD goes overseas or goes to other countries, that isn't lost. It doesn't hurt our economy. That's just not true. Now, if you want to talk about what's an appropriate way to distribute income in the United States to different classes of people. I'm all for that. I love That's redistribution. Exactly what I'm talking, sure, I'm then talk, let's talk about tax policy, not you're, this you're, weird you're, idea. No, no, no. That, I don't want to talk <laughs> about tax policy. I want to stress the point about immigration. The point okay. I'm making, the point I'm making, well, you can have all these, you got a lot of tricks in your bag. I'll give you that. You know, you my, can my say, oh, we're one -on -one you understand back because finance people then okay. and dollars and, and you don't take into consideration that when, when some Mexican spends $100,000 in Mexico mm -hmm. with Mexican labor to build a house in Mexico, that that is all economic activity lost to the average workers in the United States. Where does that USD okay. go in Mexico? 
What it do they do with it? Do they just bury it in a hole? Into, it, it gets translated into the national currency usually. How do they, how do they it translate it? Into, it goes into paying for goods. That's why countries see it almost as a subsidy from America to have illegal alien setting remittances. It, it's it's you know, not it's a subsidy, though. That's not, that's not how it works. <laughs> It's it's just that's large, just not it's not there's not like a magic no 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 economy, there's not a magic money government. there's not like a magic money photocopier where you take your USD into a Mexican bank and you just magically turn that into a peso that USD has to make its way back to the US in the form of the purchasing of a good or service or in some form of capital investment like that's it that, that's the, like it has there's to a happen. lot of the, the capital and investment okay listen. Let's get back to the core. Yeah, okay, question the core question. So you were telling me that illegal immigrants don't have to make to a lot of money because they don't have families, but then you told me that they actually make money and then they send the money back to their families and, in Mexico. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> Which one is it? Here's the thing. Okay. Yeah. My point. My point. See, you keep assuming that I'm going to care uh, that I, I I speak on behalf of the white working people of America. Okay? You just this said you is, wanted to automate their fucking agricultural I'm, jobs. How are you telling me that you want to speak on their behalf? You where said, that? Even, you, so, even sure, though, so even you literally that, said, and I quote it because I wrote it down. White, white, you said, people, no, no. white people are actively discriminated so from agricultural You literally jobs. said, proven, quote, you said, and, quote, and many, many immigrants are, are selected for you, you literally said, quote, use machines for agricultural labor. Issues. Like you literally said that. Do you, for, do you remember saying that or... Let, let me let me let me let me rewind the tape for you. Okay. Okay. What I said, what I said. Mm -hmm. you, so you, I said that immigration is a problem in many ways. Okay. You said, but we need mass immigration. We need these people. I never said we to, needed to mass have, immigration, but go ahead. Oh, okay. We need immigration to uh -huh. do agricultural work so that food is affordable. I never said that. This was your claim, but go ahead. To, to, okay. Well, people can rewind the video later and see. Sure, it. they can. Fine. Where so I said you, we you need made, immigration. You made the claim that it's yeah. necessary to keep food cheap. I, on the other hand, uh -huh. showed you. Many, many industrialized countries with the exact same system America has, where they do not have any immigration, and they have affordable food as well. So the, the, the point I'm getting at here is that that is not an argument for immigration, the fact that it keeps food cheap. Let's stick to the fucking core argument. Sure, stick to the core. Argument. So you're going to compare the U.S., okay, to places like Japan that have an insanely high cost of living for food or higher cost of food than the U.S. The U.S. has food prices have been going up in America, too. So I mean, what what is yeah, your point? Yeah, they've been the, going up too, the, but not the, as much the as they have cost, been in Japan. The higher the higher cost of food in Japan is compensated by higher wages. That's just how it works. Okay, and the reason they have higher wages is there's less uh, competition for jobs from immigrants. I mean, it's market 101, buddy. This is something that people have always taken into account, always acknowledged until very recently, where like the both the communists. And the capitalists like yourself, the neoliberals like yourself, you guys agree with Cato Institute bullshit, but that doesn't make it true. Okay, the reason why Wait, so is, is economics one hundred and one all bullshit, or are you citing it? Because I don't know. Economics one hundred and one says that if there's more people competing for a job, wages are going to be lower. That's that's not controversial. But, but it, it it is because it's more complicated than that, right? Higher well, available. You saying that. You, you said economics 101. I'm telling you what economics 101 says. Sure, if there's I can more tell people you, competing for mm -hmm. a job, you're going to get paid a lot yeah, less. Yeah, but you're, 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 assuming, you're assuming that putting more people in a certain market competing for a job will only have the impact of those people competing for a certain job. You're not taking into account the other types of economic activity that can bolster native wages as well. For instance, more labor being available in a given area might allow you to open up other businesses. In those businesses that open up, complementary positions for like management or supervisors will open that generally natives are more qualified for than immigrants. This is why when people People have studied massive immigration to different areas, and they've tried to find all these horrible impacts on native wages. It's generally not found. There is a certain subclass of people, generally people without a high school education, that'll take like a two to four percent loss in income over like let, a long term. Let me term. refer to you for, to the to the to the number one guy who studied the economic impact of immigration on wages. This guy is George Borjas. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Borjas' research and his responses to David Card on his big Muriel Boatlift study. And Borjas himself will tell you that it's about 2 to 4% earnings in just high school graduates with no college education. That's his, his it. His 1995 study found that $500 billion have been redistributed away from natives into profits for capitalists. That is the actual sum that he so came up with. That, so... Five hundred billion dollars taken from from American it, workers. It's it's 
it's really interesting. And, and, no, 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 wait, wait, real quick. Wait, no, hold on. Just so I can respond to that. Because I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. So that $500 billion, what he said is there's probably been a negative fiscal impact of immigrants by about $500 billion, but there's probably been a positive sure. economic impact of about $500 billion. He said that at the end of the day, what we need is a better tax policy that can allocate money away from the winners of that immigration policy back towards natives. That's his contention. He's not saying that we need no, no immigration. He's just saying that a form of wealth transfer. I'm not saying what his you, opinions. I'm saying I'm talking about this one study, this one statistic. So you, I, you I, say I'm very familiar. That, with it. I've literally, just, I know, I've literally hey, read the article. Oh, we can look at the chat. Hold on. No, no, no. Let me, let me, well, you, you're because you're misquoting. Hey. You're making it sound like he's anti-immigration. No, he's you're not. the one that's misquoting. You say I say five hundred billion dollars in profits for capitals, which is what he says. Big business. It's concentrated in the hands of a few. Yeah. Okay. And that money is taken. That's five hundred billion dollars taken from the many. Okay, that's the point I'm making. That American workers lost five hundred billion dollars, and lo and behold, it's in the pocket of the big capitalists in this country. And guess what? These people use it to to to. They don't use it in productive ways. That's the first thing you can say. Progressive tax policy. I say let's end immigration and put that money back in the pockets of the people in this country. And the way you do that is with tax policy. No, you don't. You do it by ending immigration, deporting all illegals. That's how you fucking do it. Sure. So I'm going to literally let me so, like sure. it, throw okay. them up against the wall. Sure. So uh, let me let me wait, 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 real quick, real quick, because I'm going to I'm just going to yeah. read the article because I'm very familiar with this Borja's article where he talks about this 500 billion figure. So I'm literally quoting Borja himself, which is the guy that you decided to cite, by the way. But we're worrying yeah. about the wrong things with policy fights focused on how many and which immigrants to accept and not enough on how to mitigate the harm that they create along the way. To use a label recently coined by Larry Summers, a quote unquote responsible nationalist, policy can, cannot ignore the reality that immigration has made some natives poorer. A policy that keeps them in mind might tax the agricultural and service companies that benefit so much from low-skilled immigrants and use the money to compensate low-skilled Americans for their losses and to help them transition to new jobs and occupations. Similarly, Bill Gates claims that Microsoft creates four new jobs for every H-1B visa granted. If true, firms like Microsoft should be willing to pay many thousands of dollars for each of these coveted visas. Those funds could be used to compensate and retrain the affected natives in the high-tech industry. If you're going to cite somebody like Borjas, know that Borjas's prescriptions for these problems is with tax policy. It's not just not, closing I, the border. I'm not whoa, 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 whoa. It's not just I'm not closing the borders. What his okay, well, are. I'm just going to say that I'm concerned because I have different. He's l listen. There's a difference between pr a diagnosis and and the 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 solution, right? So he's diagnosing the problem. He has a different solution than me. I agree with you. Okay. Why would I'm you not say? Why would I, you I give a, a diagnosis? I'm not a George sure. Borjaist who is going to uh, follow every single thing he believes on everything. That, why would okay? you take the diagnosis of somebody that has so much more training and background in this and then give your own prescription? That's like saying, I went to the doctor and they diagnosed me with cancer, but I ignored his chemo suggestions. I'm going to go do homeopathy or some shit. Because if you're a critical thinker, you okay. can take information other people, hard data other people come up with, and you can create different types of, of solutions. That's why Donald Trump got elected in 2016. He got elected because statistics like Borjas were concerning to Americans, and they did the, the obvious thing, which is vote for less immigration, okay? Because that obviously would help redistribute some of that money. I mean, you know, forget forget immigration. You know, th there's no political will to raise taxes on the wealthy either. But that's another question. Wait, but raising let me, let me, taxes let me, on the you know, wealthy? I, I, wanna, wait, I, wanna, wait, wait, I also oh, want to tell them Raising myth. taxes on the wealthy is one of the few things that all Americans are united on, even Republicans. Yes, so there and is good luck getting report. Congress to do it. Good luck getting Congress to do it. Well, maybe but under anyway, a Biden my, presidency it'll happen. Okay. Sh yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, right. We'll All see. right, go uh, ahead. Listen, let's finish this segment up, and no, then we'll let Destiny get a topic, and we'll let you get a topic. Yeah, let go me ahead. Just, let me just give uh, Mr. Destiny over here. Uh, you know, I, I would I would like you know for all you socialists listening, all you people that follow Vosh, who's a phony socialist. He, uh, you know, what, one thing I'll say aside from everything, I don't want to talk bad about the guy. He's not here, but I saw a debate. I do, but I'll resist. But yeah, go. I saw, go a, debate, ahead. I saw a debate with him and Sargon about immigration. Yeah. And I saw that Vosh was quoting the Cato Institute for reasons why immigration is great for the country. And I'm like, bro, do you know what the Cato Institute is? You know, for all you Vosh fans listening, all you angry Vosh fans, the Cato Institute also has has studies that show that 10 year olds in China working in, in, in not in China, in India, working in sweatshops is good for the economy. So this is an example of the most rapacious, evil globalist capitalism on the planet. Christ. They are there to rationalize this kind of horrible, this, this horrible, inhumane system. And the Cato Institute is quoted by these phony socialists. No socialist who supports immigration 
is a true socialist. He's a neoliberal wearing red. That's all it is. He's no different than Destiny in many ways. So, uh, so anyway, let me just let me just get back to the topic uh, quickly. Well, wait, wait, uh, hold on. He just like brought the whole team. Bound, 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 Kana and Morales, 2017 study. In 2001, the number of American workers displaced by foreign labor. This is again, by the way, this is about the H-1B program, not about because there's, there's this bullshit talking point that it's only low skilled workers. These are high skilled workers. Many Americans want to work in tech because it's one of the highest paying industries in this country and it's suffering because of immigration. In 2001, they found, and this is before H-1Bs really exploded, they found that the number of American workers qualified for jobs were dis displaced by H-1B foreign labor approached 11%. 11% of Americans with STEM degrees, very expensive and debted up their ass. They can't get jobs in STEM because foreigners are being imported to do the job. In the same year, they calculated that their wages would have been 5% higher that year if the H-1B visa program did not exist. This is a 2017 study. Okay. Now, you can say, well, 5%, it's not a big deal. But if you're making 80 grand a year, 5% is a, is a lot of money. Okay. So that, that's, and this is probably an, underestim, uh, an underestimation. Let's talk about construction. You know, the, the, in, in 1973, Destiny, a construction worker in California made 31.84 an hour. Today, a construction worker makes 25.97 an hour. That's a, almost six dollars less. Well, this is a lot of money. This is not taking into account how much the median cost of living in California has risen since 1973. Uh, how about care workers, health workers? It says the, the, the demand for home care workers has risen 20 percent, and yet their wages don't go up. Male care worker wages have decreased by 16 percent from 2005 to 2015. And this correlates perfectly with an influx of immigrant labor in the field, which is estimated to be 20%. This is one of the lowest paying industries in the country, even though there's a massive demand for it. American workers could be doing these jobs. You know, this is this is my point, Destiny. Is that yeah, so this I, is can not? We, can we do this? Like, can we move like work? point by point? Because like you misquote so much sure, stuff, and it makes me weak to, to like not be able to respond to it. So like for, for this 2017 paper that you cited, right? Like so in just reading in, in reading the abstract at the end here, right? Um, in, in the absence of immigration, wages for U.S. computer scientists would have been 2.6 percent to 5.1 percent higher, and employment in computer science for U.S. workers would have been 6.1 percent to 10.8 percent higher in 2001. This is a pretty old data set. The tech industry has changed quite a bit since then, but sure, in 2000. On the other hand, well, tech has also grown monumentally in the past 20 years. I'm not sure if you've been here or not. I don't know how old what you is, are. Have H-1B visas grown compared to the growth, actually? Well, I don't know. Or what not. do you think? Do you have those numbers on hand absolutely. or are you just going to make an assumption? Absolutely. They're, they're a little down now, but the, the tech industry is constantly fighting. You have you have situations like AT&T where they're using the, the this it, it, they're, they're bringing people in and getting the American workers. This is thousands of American workers. They have to train their replacements. OK, I mean, this is not a joke. This is not something I'm just making up. This is happening in this country. OK, so I, I, I would need to see the numbers because like STEM degrees, including comp sci degrees, pay like a significantly like higher sum of money than other forms, other comparable forms of degrees. Like the, no. pay, the, the compensation for these degrees is astronomical. So the idea that these workers are being hurt, maybe in some marginal sense they are in the in the very in the one paper that you quoted that I was able to find. And I would have to go through and find I'm, I'm willing to bet you're probably misquoting or misciting every single thing you're bringing up um, based on what you said just so just far. Say that but, doesn't mean it's true. Well, but every Every single thing I've looked into has been true. So, for instance, at the really? end of the abstract, you just read the paper, and it gives me the truth there. So I wasn't done reading. You started so cutting me off. That. So, the ending part of this is, on the other hand, complements in production benefited substantially from immigration, and immigration also lowered prices and raised the output of IT goods by between 1.9 and 2.5 percent, thus benefiting consumers. Finally, firms in the IT sector also earned substantially higher profits due to immigration. So, it sounds to me, if these workers are coming in and making these uh, uh, these uh, pro these firms 
like f so far more profitable. And if consumers are saving money, sounds like we just need to tax people that use H-1Bs a little bit more, like Borjas himself even suggested. And that would fix all of these problems. We would, we would how, would it fix, how would it fix problems? How is taxing a corporation alone going to fix the problem of someone who can't get it, who, who, who's passed up for a job? That, this this, this doesn't exist. This country. person doesn't exist. All of these so people. So no, American no, no. workers aren't trained. That wasn't a big campaign issue in 2016 for Trump. The big campaign. Out there no, all, it wasn't. No, 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 it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It was oh, not it a big. No, oh, okay. if it was a big issue, right. then why would hashtag learn to code have been so controversial? The issue was that Trump construction rally, workers bro. and people that worked in manufacturing in the Rust Belt were losing jobs, not people losing jobs H1B to H1B visas. That is absolutely not true. Don't tell me that there were all these middle class everyone, everyone workers, these YouTube white right collar now, workers, H1B these, workers, Trump rally. And you will see them. They were speaking at Trump events. This is a problem, it's, and it's, it's one of the not, problems that got Trump not. election, despite not. all of his flaws. It's just and you're not. just it's there. Just not. It's not we can all right now look up median wages paid to people with these tech degrees. They're fucking massive. The wage yes, premium and that's they should be higher, and, the and, and they're they not should being, be higher. They're already paid they, higher than most equivalent workers around the world. What do you mean? You These people are compensated you know higher than every other equivalent most, degree in our economy. Most, oh, wait, wait, gentlemen, you, you, most you gentlemen. Save on, okay. Go ahead. Let's just rein it in. One point to you, Striker. One point to you, Destiny. I'll read the super chats and then we'll move to the next segment. Sure, is that my, okay? sure. My only point is that as of 2018, this the tech sector is literally begging for jobs. If anybody in this like in this fucking chat right now works for, or, or I'm sorry, goes to university and is working a comp sci, companies are constantly advertising, trying to bring people in from the schools into places to work. This idea that H-1B visas have flooded out the entire economy and that no one is hiring these workers is laughable. Maybe with a data set from 2000 and fucking one when people were still using Ask Jeeves and Yahoo. Maybe back then it had a more detrimental or deleterious well, no, impact. But they were all my that, point. But wait, today, let him finish. Today, let him finish. Today, and then I'll let you finish. And then we'll move tech on. Tech workers Go are ahead, some of the most in-demand fucking jobs in the world. There is like a literal like half million job deficit right now of tech workers, which is why companies are begging for H-1Bs because we don't even have enough tech workers in the United States to fill these fucking jobs. All right. Now, Stryker, don't interrupt him. Just let him finish. And then I'll read these and then we'll Go to the next. Go ahead. So here's the thing. Okay. The pro the, the profits that uh, the, the so-called consumer uh, savings, first of all, uh, I would, even if that were true, I would say maybe tech stuff should be a little more expensive if it means American workers get the job and they're compensated for what their, their work is worth. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that the, the 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 companies that go out there and say, oh, we have a labor shortage. We can't find people to work. The way you can, if, if significant numbers of STEM workers are not working in STEM, okay, I can find you the statistic. It's actually a pretty, pretty big number. Would you like me to find it yes. for you? Or do, do you need the pedantic? Uh, okay. I'm super curious how we're all these STEM degree holders all right. that can't earn any okay, money. Okay. Yeah. I'll do that in a minute. Okay. I'll look it up. But, but here's the thing. Yes. Uh, the, the, the point is that the companies pretend that they have a labor shortage so that they can pressure the government to expand the H-1B system. OK, and th so this is this is the story for everything. You see also like uh, other industries, they, they're like, we can't find people to work. We can't. Well, why haven't they tried increasing benefits and pay? Because if you increase benefits and pay for a job, you're going to get people that are willing to move around the country. You're going to get people, you, you know, the, these are these problems. Are are essentially created by the companies themselves. They're not really suffering from this. It's not another thing too. Is that you know what the work quality of work? Just anecdotally, the quality of work. I mean, the reason why Windows is garbage and every year it gets worse is because it's a bunch of Indians fucking making it, and they work for cheap, and they're not as good. You know, the reason why basically, you know, all these tech companies are just sitting on properties that they just keep remaking over and over and over, like the iPhone. This is they're they're fucking out of ideas. Why are they out of ideas? Well, they don't hire white workers. They hire all these Indians to do it. That's just anecdotal. Listen, I'm not saying that that I have hard uh, facts and numbers to to support that, but anecdotally, that's what I mean. And 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 when it comes to the hard the hard numbers, I'll just f finish with this: mm -hmm. to to deny that the H-1B system was being used to not fill in gaps, but to replace Americans, anyone. Anyone can go on YouTube, look one, look up H-1B 
or Google H1B Trump rally or whatever, you will see the people that were working for Disney, AT&T, all these co big major companies in America. They were in, working in tech or STEM or whatever, and they were being replaced and they were taught to, they were, they were forced to train their replacements, which is the most undignified and humiliating thing. And it's all done to save on labor costs. Okay. And most of those profits, my friend, do not go back to the consumer. Those profits go to the fucking shareholders. And you might think that's morally right, but I don't think it is. I think that workers, white workers in this country should benefit from our companies. We created the infrastructure in this country. The, we are the ones, you know what, if India is full of so many geniuses, why is their country a fucking shithole? Okay. That's what I would say. So, you know what? That's that's just yeah. That's just me right. finishing up. There's like there are so many weird stories here. What? I, I, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The fact that if Microsoft's be... core workers are fucking Indians because you see like commercials with IT guys like answering fucking calls or scamming people. Jesus right. fuck. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead, bro. All right. Yeah. Now you're gonna have the opportunity opportunity to raise the next point. So it's up to you. And also, I mean, I had this slated for two hours. There's like you know 30 minutes left. So if you guys want to go longer, I'm fine with that. But I, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, more than fine with it, actually. But uh, the real tension, he says, D Destiny versus Ricada when Nick isn't dumb like Stryker. Robert32 says, if Destiny can talk faster, I might believe him. Chromatron says, five-hour stream. Come on, press one for five-hour stream. Uh, King Porgy says, nobody wants to go to the West Coast. Gross. Well, I was trying to go to the West Coast, actually, on Thursday, but they're not going to let me. So uh, King Porgy says, Destiny drags Stryker into the weeds, and Stryker is too high, I high T, excuse me. IT almost said because of the last conversation. Too high T to avoid the trap. Quote the stream. BG White says, "Can the guest agree to shit on Kelly Lo Kelly uh, Loeffler, whatever the fuck her name is?" And I did intend to bring that up. The senators' uh, insider trading, and uh, I've made my feelings known uh, on Twitter about that. Uh, not a fan, uh, but maybe we'll get to that. Ober Groipen Fuhrer just subscribed for six months. Thank you. Uh, Bethica 73 says Destiny Kang of fast talking bullshit. Wowzers. Uh, a helpful friend says, Is the is the Spurg out for Adderall Addict at three now? Pits of Cowboy says, ha, ha, money printer go burr. Pug Dog says, talk about Zog. Keep the eyes on the ball, striker. Uh, Mega Meme says money printer brr. Arcade Outpost says, Who remembers AOL movie phone? I actually do. I'm that old. Pits of Cowboy says, Money comes back when we send it. Don't tell. Don't tell Israel. Arcade Outpost says, Destiny Machine, go brr. Pensive Cowboy says, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. Robert32 says, Destiny talks fast. Some poops are fast sometimes. Herbert Silvatici says, Destiny is the Shapiro sound alike. I just got here. Robert32 says, Trump was elected because white people are fed up. Arcade Outpost says, Stop debating Saint GDP. Culture is more important. Arcade Outpost says, Never drink in Destiny. King Porgy says, unmute Ozzy Mozzy. He's a good boy, Ralph. No, he's a piece of shit, and he will never be unmuted. Uh, but I'll take I'll take that uh, as it is. Uh, Anon Semper says, Michelle Malkin pinned Twitter thread about H1B. Now, it's your turn, Destiny. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't even know where to start. It's, it sounds like you literally called in. It sounds like you called into Apple tech support on your fucking iPhone, and you heard an Indian on the phone, and you think that like everybody in these fucking boardroom meetings or everybody like working on like the core software is like some fucking guy all right, all right. that they fucking like imported from fucking India. So I, like, like everybody yes. knows. Well, yeah, no, wait, right. what do you Indians mean? don't work at, at Microsoft. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm sure uh, that they do in some so, positions, but the idea that core yeah. software is being developed by like random fucking immigrants is just so hilarious. It's always funny because the only people that make these claims are people that have no. No fucking first-hand experience in this industry at all let, like if you let, talk like and the idea that these people should offer the the idea that people well, well, hold on we, these are all part you stack all of these bullshit we're running out of on time of we gotta other. hit the jq buddy we, we're oh, we'll get there i'm sure okay and the idea that like companies can just increase benefits like the the upper end of the wages starting out for like just comp sci majors is literally upwards of 100 to 150 thou like there are so many fucking startups and tech firms you can hire at. what do you think they're gonna do just like like if they just offer enough benefits like randomly fucking comp sci people are just gonna like puff out of fucking thin air or some shit like it takes time to get these degrees that's why schools are like dramatically okay. trying to up how many people they can train for these fucking jobs um right. the, the idea that like hiring more white workers at like a fucking a a apple store to be like an iphone genius is going to make like more iphone that's ideas works. or something I, like works. all of these like anecdotal these weird things are like so fucking strange I, I and like are clearly coming from somebody that has like no in industry experience and isn't even familiar okay. with like the broad statistics related to it gotcha. like anybody right. that works in any of these industries or anybody that like goes to school for any of these industries 
knows how hilariously fucking wrong you are. They know that these companies are dramatically advertising to pull in workers for their jobs. They know that the wages paid to these people is dramatically fucking high. Like, on, like every to pretty the much. Next topic, yeah, we, yeah, we can on. move. Yeah, that's fine. If you to walk back everything you said, we can move on because almost every single thing you said was wrong. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. What, what is our? What are our next topics? Jesus. Okay. Um, you know what? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ralph, I'm sorry. Uh, can, since we're running out of time, can we hit the JQ real quick? I don't want to. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I don't want to cuck uh, Destiny, but um, l l let's say. So, my, my contention, Destiny, is that the, the, the Jewish community has enormous amounts of power over the United States of America. And this is seen in the finance industry, it's seen in the media, but it's. Very, very interesting how our foreign policy is particularly in the pocket of the Jews. And before you dismiss that as a mindless conspiracy theory, I can name you a number of foreign policy and geopolitical academics that agree with me. John Mearsheimer, Lawrence Wilkerson, Paul Pilar, Chaz Freeman, Eli Clifton. Can we talk about Andrew J. I don't know, just all these, all yeah, I don't know these, just all dropping these, a bunch of names as opposed well, to. Well, these are these are because I know that credentialism is very important to you. So that's why I'm saying it hasn't, but I haven't used that at all. One you, way you, or, you literally people, just invented that position. Have, have yeah. said that, that yeah. Zionists, sure. Just that just to Zionists be clear, you literally Jews just have, invented have you invented that position for me to, to try to sound like you're making okay, a good I'm not gonna finish. All right, go ahead, babble. Sure. So you just invented that claim. I haven't like made any big deal about people being credentialed or whatever. You just are really excited to throw out five names you've memorized for the Jewish question. So just to be clear, okay. I don't give a fuck about like, oh, this guy is super credentialed okay. or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, go ahead. We can talk about the like, actual ideas Fair and enough. not just Fair throwing enough. out random Fair names. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm just saying that the, because the reason is that what, what turns a conspiracy theory in, in a, in a, for, for a, a neoliberal kind of person that doesn't think for themselves like you, what turns a conspiracy theory into a fact is if the the people in the academy or intellectuals agree. So well, some, these are people that, that study cited, this. Like, these, are, these, are, these are a number of people that study this stuff for a living, and in their careers they have said, and this is despite all the major institutional backlash that they've risked and gotten for it. Academics get said, institutional backlash that Zionists, all the time. That the, that, the Jewish, that the Jewish lobby in America essentially dictates American foreign policy. Uh, I, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, let, let's talk about it. Like, what kind of foreign policy are you talking about? Like, let's be a little bit more specific. Um, so, for about, instance, when you talk about, talk about when you talk about Mearsheimer, right? Like, so I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about. I know that he wrote some stuff about APAC, but like that doesn't even talk to the public, right? That's a lobby that literally only talks to policymakers. So, uh, do you want to specifically talk about like decisions that Congress makes in, insofar as like doing foreign policy, or what? What like let's be a little bit more specific. Well, I want to I want to like, ask you if the fact that the the two the donors, the biggest donors to both parties, Jewish, if that has any role on whether Jew, on whether politicians will listen to APAC, uh, is, do you think there's there might be anything to that? They might, no, because the numbers APAC just don't numbers really pan out. So, like, I kind of looked into this because I was curious because I figured we would talk about this, right? So, the right. top ten donors, Jewish and non-Jewish, gave fifty million dollars, okay, in, in the last presidential election cycle, and and the total about, amount of Jewish donors gave between one hundred to one hundred and sixty million, right? The total spending in those campaigns was two point five billion dollars in twenty twelve. Jewish donors comprised about six percent of spending to all presidential campaigns compared to their two percent representation in the population. Like, yeah, were they Excuse overrepresented? Me? Were they so? Jews make up about two percent of the population. They comprise about six percent of spending on the presidential election. Six percent of spending. Show me, show me, show me your numbers in the twenty twelve election. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to look into that, but we. I am more familiar with the twenty sixteen election. Okay. Where the, the two biggest donors uh, for Hillary Clinton, it was one of them is Haim Sabin. He's an Israeli. Um, he gave Hillary Clinton. Uh, a lot of money. Let me, well, what does uh, a lot of money top, mean? He's, he's the top donor. He what does a lot donor. of money mean? Well, I can look up the exact number. Well, so uh, that, that could mean like ten million dollars, or that could mean like one billion dollars. Like, what do you? Well, if you're the number one donor, if you're if if you if you're the number one donor to a, a candidate, is that person gonna? Because if you look at the Hillary Clinton's WikiLeaks, you'll see that Haim Sabin is constantly emailing her on what to say about Israel. That's in her WikiLeaks. So you know. Maybe that money does, because I remember you said something very stupid, which is that lobbyists don't have influence on policy. Yeah, it doesn't seem and, to be the case. Yeah. 
Yeah. But we, so, we still haven't established any, like, I'm curious, how much money do you think that he's, because if this guy's donated, like, five million, I'm curious if you think that's enough to, like, dictate, like, American foreign policy, ignoring the fact might, that- it might, it might change your mind on, on certain policies regarding Israel? Not if really. I think that probably the overwhelming support oh, I, that- Probably the overwhelming spot that Americans in general have for Israel is probably more determining of our, determining of our foreign policy related to Israel than like some individual lobbyist, some secretary of state, you, or somebody running for you, president. Yeah, what would you say? What would you say about? I what think has that the so overwhelming much? support that Americans have for Israel is probably more relevant to our foreign policy decisions really? than some donor oh. of Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Well, Americans overwhelmingly support many things mm -hmm. they support you know I, I know you might dispute the immigration thing i mean i think there's overwhelming support for that but you're going to dispute that yeah because the numbers don't back uh, it up yeah sure yeah you're gonna you're gonna have like the, the numbers that say would you deport the mexican children no the numbers are how might. important do you think uh immigration is or like the racial makeup of the united well, states how about, or whatever, how about yeah. medicare for all like medicare for all mm -hmm. is very popular with both parties no it's and not yet people, no it's people not. don't get that it's not very popular with both parties well, do the democrat exit polls and increasingly look at republican polls that say people like it yep and if you look at and if you look at if you look at well but hold on if you because you made a wrong claim if you look at kff polls or people that poll like related to healthcare policy you find that one the majority of people don't even know what medicare for all means and two you find that the people's reception to Medicare for all um, differs dramatically based on how you pose the question. So, for instance, if I ask right, Americans, okay. how do you feel about a government program that gets rid of all private insurance? That's like 22 percent popular. If I say, okay. how do you feel about a government program that covers all Americans? That's like 74 percent popular. So sure. the idea okay, that fine. Americans I'll overwhelming. Meet, I'll, okay, meet sure. you, I'll meet you halfway. OK, sure. I'll meet you halfway. Uh, and, and let's say the, the one that all Americans are covered by a government program. OK, well, that's not that's not being turned into policy. Right. Uh, you know, taxing billionaires is popular. It's not turned into policy. Regulating banks is popular, not turned into policy. Uh, Americans, Republicans more actually, uh, are, are, are souring on America's foreign wars. And yet we keep having them. And, and Trump is, is antagonizing Iran. There's probably going to be a war in the second term. I, I can't say for sure. But that stuff's not popular. Uh, so the point I'm making is that why is it that suddenly Israel, quote, being overwhelmingly popular is the explanation for why it's a bipartisan consensus? Like, I really doubt that the people that vote for Bernie Sanders are pro-Israel. Right? Like, the, uh, wait, 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 hold on so, real quick, because this is how, like, all of this works and just building bullshit claim after bullshit claim after bullshit claim. Like, the tax cuts that Trump did were overwhelmingly popular. This idea that people were against them, Republicans, is just not true. Mm. Um, this idea that foreign policy doesn't ha buckle to pressure at home, I mean, we literally just left Afghanistan in fucking shambles, okay? Um, and we, are, like, basically completely threw years. away. We basically completely threw away, like, everything that we had in Iraq pulling into that country as well. Now, I'm not now. I know a lot of people might misconstrue this as I'm pro-Afghan or Iraq war. Mm. Whatever. <laughs> However, there is massive uh, domestic pressure yeah. to, to get us out of these countries, and our leaders actually did. Like, we stopped supporting, like, fucking rebels and shit in Syria uh, due to the effects that that was happening in Europe and because of foreign policy at home. Like, we absolutely have to deal with pressure at home related to our foreign policy. The idea that we don't is laughable. Like, it's a huge part of our foreign policy. So, oh, in, in, uh, in 2016, uh, Haim Sabin, let me, let, me, let me name you. The, the two biggest contributors to the Democrats and Republicans in that ran in 2016. Okay. Uh, there's a, uh, okay. The Pritzkers gave 16 million to Hillary. The Pritzkers are Zionist Jews. Sabin Capital Group. That's Heim Sabin's group. $12 million. Paloma Partners is run by a Jew. $21 million. Uh, News Web Corps. I'm not sure if that's a Jew, but that's $11 million. Soros Fund Management, $10 million. These are the top donors of Hillary Clinton. If you look at uh, Donald Trump, um, you get Sheldon Adelson. Now, what do Sheldon Adelson and Heim Sabin, Heim Sabin, a big Democrat donor, Sheldon Adelson, a big GOP donor, what do they have in common? And by the way, th this is just a Hillary Clinton. This is not uh, just about... Um, the, the two candidates, but also like the Zionists. L l let me just give you some numbers here. Well, all in well, all, well, can we like make it? You're second, just like on naming on names and second. throwing hold out on, random numbers. Finish, like you haven't made an argument yet. Point you, you know, You're not making a point, point, but go ahead. Let me finish my point. So the top donors, these uh -huh. are the names of the donors that gave one billion, one billion dollars together to Hillary Clinton. Dustin Moskowitz, the Pritzkers, George Soros, the Lawfers. Donald Sussman is, runs Paloma parties, gave $21 million. Hyman Sheryl Sabin, Daniel Abraham, James Simons, 
Okay, you, you see a pattern here, buddy? You see a pattern? They're all fucking Jews, and they collected a billion dollars together. They're all Zionist Jews. Maybe some would argue George Soros isn't one. So you're telling but, me that Hillary Clinton's campaign raised over a billion dollars from yeah. Jews? Yes. Okay, so... And I'm just looking because basically every single thing, every single story. Can, I, I, wait, wait, real quick, real quick. Me, me, so, like the number that I'm looking at right now. So, Hillary Clinton's campaign on its own raised $623 million in 2016. The party and joint fundraising committees raised another $600 million. And then Super raised million. So, of the $1.4 billion that Hillary raised, you're telling me $1 billion of that came from Jews. You really, you really largely, think that's accurate? Yes, largely from Zionist Jews. So, okay. I'm, I would, I would. Considering every single source you've yeah, given me exactly. so far has either disagreed with you or just been this, outright, yeah, here, like, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, I mean, I don't, I I'm figure like, out how to link it to you. But, go, since, but how about but need, like uh, walk me through uh, the next oh, part oh, of this? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, walk me through oh, the next oh, oh. part of this. Okay, right. The next part of this is that the Donald Trump, he got his money from Bernie Marcus, Shell Nadelson. These were some of the biggest contributors to Trump. In fact, they were the biggest contributors to Trump and the Republican Party, uh, which together got uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. From from Shell Nadelson in particular, Shell Nadelson is is a hard line Israel hawk. My question to you, Destiny, is if you raise this kind of money from Jews who openly say, "I'm Saban says I am a one policy guy, Israel." That's what he says, and he's a Democrat donor. And then you have Shell Nadelson. No, he, the guy was literally sitting in on Benjamin Netanyahu's trial. So these people are basically agents of the state of Israel. They give money in the hundreds of millions to our presidential candidates. And you're going to sit here and tell me that this has nothing to do with America's Israel policy? No, I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that because most Americans support Israel, the politicians do as well. It's possible you're to just going to lie. Okay. What? You're just going to lie. I'm, I'm not lying. I mean, we can point at tons of random you don't connections actually believe of people. That. Can you can you show me like a, can you draw a link like tell me a policy that's not popular with the American people that these politicians have pushed for that like show that there's some clearly like conspiratorial effort behind the scenes to Where do I policy? start? What? <laughs> Where do I start? Okay, the, the H1B program is so unpopular even the Democrats were forced to vote against it and yet there's still talk about expanding it. Let's talk about the Iraq war which was started by basically started by a bunch of Jews at PNAC who, again, in the, in, in the Bush era, were also, you know, I don't have the statistics on hand because they're older, but... Wait, how, how do Jews push the H-1B program? Well, not... Well, actually, they do, because guess who runs Facebook? Guess who runs Google? What does Mark guess Zuckerberg who run... have to do with the H-1B program? So you're telling uh, me that... You, large... ever heard of, you ever heard... Let me, let me show you something. FWD.US. You ever heard of that thing? What about It's it? a one-issue lobby for more H-1B visas. Funded by Mark Zuckerberg. You ever heard of this? F and how, how much money do they spend on lobbying? <sighs> See, you're just doing. What does it matter? You said well, how because is, if, they spend if they spend five hundred thousand, if they spend five hundred thousand a year on lobbying, it doesn't really Mark matter Zuckerberg that much. Have to do, what does Mark Zuckerberg have to do with H one B program? And I'm showing you one of the, one of the H one B lobbies in Capitol Hill is is literally funded by him. And on top of that, he also funds politicians. Politicians funded by Google and Facebook. Also, like Mike Lee, also push for H one B visas. I think it's funny. And you're just like, oh, whoa, 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 what's the exact so number? Like, oh, I, I don't I have think an it's answer. Funny oh. that earlier, you were like, you were so happy to rattle off a ton of names and numbers because you've got like your little dialogue tree that you're prepared you know for. And then when I just, and then when I just push you for a couple you of questions, Mark can Mark I just finish one point? To, I, like before, I know that you like are really excited right. to do the JQ shit because it's like you got it all memorized or whatever. But oh, like you're, you're telling me, it's no, I'm not mad at all. I just, I think it's funny that you're implying there needs to be a conspiracy for the largest tech company owner to push for more H one B visas. Conspiracy. The, What's a it's, conspiracy? It's not like, a conspiracy. conspiracy. It sounds to me like if, the if owners. I, if I, it sounds if I to me it, like if, I if you tell me if I, the if owners, I, the dog, you just talk for like thirty minutes on like Jewish conspiracy shit. If, all, if, I, if I, you spent if I, all, if I, all this time, you spent if all this if, time, if, you spent all this time. If I'm an Israeli citizen oh and I give Hillary Clinton or the Republican Party a hundred million dollars, you could say that's a conspiracy all you want. But it doesn't change the fact that it's a fact. You spent all this time throwing numbers and names at me to tell me that tech companies are trying to push to get more tech labor You're into the country. The topic. I'm not changing. You're the one that brought up H one B citizen or H one B visas. Like, no, you said why are unpopular 
policies. No, no, whoa, whoa. You, getting, so you are pivoting so much you can't stand. One point. Let's talk about H-1B visas. Do you really think it's that surprising that tech no, no, company owner? Say our foreign policy, because I could tell you don't have an answer for this. Like, you know, can, I, I well, want oh, you no, to no. say I'll the, talk about any, I want you to I'll talk about any policy that, you want. I want you to say on the record that you can be laughed off the fucking face of the earth that if a bunch of Zionist Jews give the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign a billion dollars in, in 2016, that this will have no impact on their view of Israel. I want you to say this on the fucking record so that we can all sit here and laugh at sure. you. Okay, so we'll, Go ahead. We'll, so, so we'll, yeah, we'll run completely away from the H-1B topic because then you realize how stupid that is. I don't uh, think yeah. that Jewish citizens or Israeli people or whatever donating money to American campaigns that are running for president, I don't think are having these massive changes in foreign policy that's running contrary to American opinion on Israel. No, of course not. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Israel is massively popular with both the Democratic and the Republican Party, the voters themselves, not really? just policy makers let me pull up some uh some, some remember the democrats vote as a block uh for israel right they they, they green light it so, so it's a bipartisan they they're all clapping together uh so let's uh let's look at some statistics you, do, are you familiar with the statistics uh for democrats and like would you agree that there's a very strong streak of of anti-israel sentiment in the democratic party of anti-israeli sentiment in the democratic party anti-israel sentiment what do you mean by anti-israel like you're saying like, like pro-palestine what... certain colored people it says here it's in 2017 this is a, a poll that's been published on newsweek democratic support for israel has dropped from 42 percent to 27 percent so 27% of registered Democrats support Israel. Meanwhile, every Democrat, maybe with some exceptions, maybe Lana Omar or something, will vote for more aid to Israel. Okay? So how the fuck do you explain that other than Heim Sabin's money, other than the money of these Zionist Jews? How do you explain that? Wait, how, they're, not, they're not fulfilling the, the wish of their constituents. How, why are they doing it? What do, what do you... What do you? I I don't even know what the fuck you're asking me right now. So, can can you phrase that in like a question? I, I don't. I have no idea what the okay. fuck you just. My asked. question is: I, I just cited a statistic. Twenty-seven percent. This is in 2017. This is a poll taken. It's on Newsweek. I can link it to you if you'd like. Yeah, you can like you do that? Yeah, throw it? the link in the chat. Yeah, just so I can see what the, what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, twenty-seven percent. This Newsweek is just an annoying site because it just blares music when you get on it. But twenty-seven percent of Democratic voters do not support israel i mean uh support israel 27 percent support israel amongst democratic voters so that means that the majority do not okay so, so why no, so democrat, hold on so wait wait so the poll said wait so wait wait so what you just said wait wait so what you just said what you just said was a lie so democrats are divided on the middle situation as 27 percent say their sympathies lie more with the israelis and 26 percent say their sympathies lie more with the palestinians with 46 percent undecided so what you just said was a lie it's not that the majority of them are against it it's that most are, are, are a plurality is undecided this is why i can't trust anything you bring up this is why i'm asking okay, you for well, sources because you're literally you're okay, misciting you said, almost you said, everything you bring you said, up let, let's let's meet halfway then. No 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 no. no 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 hold on hold on. I'm not meeting you halfway. What you just said was a bold faced fucking lie because you hoped no, I wouldn't look up your poll. I said the majority of Democrats were against do not them. Like Israel. Yeah, and that's not the, what undecided the, I means. I can find other statistics for that, but here's the twenty seven percent say their sympathies well, lie they, more with Israelis, twenty six percent say their sympathies lie more with the Palestinians. Also, this is over one very specific instance, not like the support for Israel in general. And with forty six percent you other statistics. Maybe you should have found those hey, maybe you should have found those. The, Maybe you should have found those for this conversation. Point, get back to the bigger point. Maybe you should have found bigger. those for this conversation that, and not thrown me let, one that you misquoted. You know, the, the idea that, Demo that Democratic voters are not fond of Israel is not even controversial. You're just being tactical about this. But here's the thing. So if 40, let's say 46 percent, you know, uh, are undecided and 26 percent are, are pro-Palestinian, uh, that means a majority of Democrats either don't care about Israel or don't support it. Sure. So okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and throw a poll here from 2019. So why okay? is this the, such the, a the question was the question all was Democrats thinking about the relationship between the United States and Israel. Do you think the U.S. is too supportive? Gentlemen, we can't understand. Can okay. we talk? I can't, I can't just time. have him like fucking you... lie about a poll. I know. And then no, it's fine. Guys, 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 guys. It's fine. He's just like he's just like literally like misquoting the fuck out of everything. Why are you making a baby voice? It's not a criticism of either person. I'm just saying like. 
I usually let it go. But oh, let's, I don't have an argument. To... Stop lying. I know that you're mad All because right, you're literally getting called out on every stupid <laughs> fucking thing you said. I, I, I threw like two. Here's a Gallup poll. Here's a polling report. This idea that Americans don't support Israel is fucking hilariously uninformed. You being a fucking uh -huh. Nazi, you should know this, uh -huh. right? Like at the very uh -huh. least, you could hit me with arguments about how like, well, maybe the media is controlling Americans to be pro-Israel. Like we could go into that. I've got a whole bunch of stuff prepared <laughs> on media. Not, but I, like I, this go, idea, go, this go, idea. Go to a diner or a bar and ask people about what they care about. Israel is not even the top hundred issues. Issues. You're fucking. We're not you're talking about shit. if it's in the top issues. You're That's a totally shit. separate you're, question. Yeah, for the Jews. No, what I'm saying you, is that you like, want to live your oh life playing God. video games. Holy with money. shit! Well, right now I'm and living my life shitting on some dumb fuck Nazi you, that wanted to open up a conversation about music <laughs> and your platform. <laughs> So, you know, give me a break, man. What, what is, is the break, dude? You, on, right. on almost every single source you've given me you're tonight, there you've either been that wrong, that you, unfamiliar with the source, the or you've been Oh, no, they don't support Israel because well, of that. No. I'm not, you know what? No, I'm willing to bet that if I look into you, those man. numbers, they're not even true. What because literally you know? everything you've given me that I've looked up has been false. Like, holy shit, dude. Like, the image of fucking albums and stuff, 4chan people argue this shit better than you. Like, you're an embarrassment to fucking Nazis. Do you realize that? Do you realize how low the bar is? I could probably find a random dude... I bet you if I were to go yeah. and check the fucking poll threads right now, there Dude, are people on there saying Stryker sucks dick at arguing you, you, for third you, positionism. That fucking cares? Enoch was giving better arguments what than what fucking Stryker no, could. Uh, that he's you're, literally you're falling thing, apart man. right now to you're a guy that sucks you're, dick you're, it's, that plays video you're, games professionally. Well, That's how much of an embarrassment you are right now. Like, holy shit, do you realize how much you're falling apart in this conversation? It's absolutely unfucking believable Jesus Christ. You got We got to maybe, I don't know, man. It's hard to argue with someone that's tripping balls on Adderall. Like, I can show you. We, maybe we should trade sources know. before that. I can help you put together a better argument because fuck, this has been an embarrassment. Like, oh, I thought this was going to be fucking hard, dude. Oh, right. wait, wait a minute. I wait thought this minute, was going to be difficult. Minute. Holy shit. Being Let's... a condescending historical. Right. Right. Okay, that's fair. We we understood what you meant. Let me read these. Maybe we can do another segment or two if you guys have the time. Right. Maybe we can just, again, I love people talking shit and. and screaming and all that but it's just a certain point where you're screaming over each other it's right. i understand it's fiery i i'm the last one to talk you know just this past weekend i had my own thing so uh, i understand completely but let's just just one at a time if you can that's the only thing not a criticism of either one you're both doing it to be quite honest but let's just let me just read these and we'll try to do another segment or two if that's okay is that yeah, okay go for it okay <clears throat> Harold Silvatiti says UK trades from EU came in, lived in a four room, I guess, apartment or flat uh, pound sent home Brits with families to support. Can't compete. Cheeseburger six says destiny. Will you publicly deny using Adderall? I don't even know. Look, I'm be the last one to talk about somebody's Listen, habits. I love I psychedelics and I fucking love MDMA, <laughs> but I don't do like Adderall or Ritalin or any of that shit. I, just, I don't get anything out of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I did drink a Red Bull, uh, Herb... though, so somebody had that. Maybe that's helping me a little bit. You know? <laughs> somebody said I was hyped up on that shit. Maybe I've had too much caffeine. Herbert Silvatiti says, uh, can't afford to compete at these lower wage rates. Uh, then he says, UK family with mortgage. Uh, he, he used the pound symbol, pounds greater than EU living in four room. It's hard to decipher some of these but i'm trying uh then he says why does chat say eric is drunk he doesn't sound drunk he doesn't sound drunk to me either it's the haters I it's the haters I know, I know how drunk sound by the way but did you check uh, the Ted last Wayne... name on some of those donations you need to trace <laughs> I'm, back I'm their getting... lineage <laughs> you should, do, you should have 23 me <laughs> submissions for every donation to check for that ashkenazi <laughs> shit or whatever you don't want to fucking oh uh, 23 and me that's that'll be the new standard <laughs> to donate here uh ted wang says striker why did head of course you know how this is oh, but okay uh, he says that. Why I have to read it. He gave me all right, all right, all right. Why did head of TRS TRS security say he became an informant when he got caught selling heroin? I don't. Well, if I've... I if I told you, I'd have to kill you. All right, there we go. Uh, Arcade Outpost says Israel is popular because of subversion. Schofield Bible uh, King Porgy says, "Okay, you don't know one hundred percent about X, therefore irrelevant." Quote some gay internet stripper. Wildbagger says, Thanks for the great week from the podcast gang gang. Shout out to the podcast. Of course, we're available on Apple and Spotify and Castbox and everywhere else. Jean Jean says, uh, Destiny, I Des, I love a uh, certain thing and my certain thing, tiny. I won't read that. Uh, Tyrone 88 says, Destiny is bisexual. You know what that means? I, not, <laughs> not really, but uh, Pinochet's. Rolf a copter says I'm a fascist and destiny won this debate. 
John John says, I think Destiny has a pretty small brain. Herbert Silvatici says, sorry, difficult to fit questions in 50 or 100 characters. Yeah, it is. I wish they would up the limit a little bit, especially when you put in a fucking $10, you know, but whatever. Uh, Proud and Frank Denier <laughs> says, this is disgusting. I, I think it's actually been pretty fun, but that's just my opinion. Uh, let's see. Inspector Bloor says, tell Destiny it looks like adult puberty hit him like a ton of simps. Big time 47 says, Destiny doesn't know what hard work it, wait, what hard work is he has. This, by the way, I'm reading this verbatim. Destiny doesn't know what hard work is. He has a degree in music and plays video games. Striker is 100% right about H1B visas. They are destroying job prospects for white American STEM students. Uh, Spurg Lama says the autism of the capitalist has no room for nuance or human empathy. Screw these pigs who only care about GDP. Just Hell for striker. reference, Hell I, I don't actually have a music degree. I had to drop out of school because I was working too much, but cl <laughs> close there. But you are a music major, but you just yeah, I was. Right? It's kind of funny that I'm like so privileged, but I had to drop out because mom and dad didn't pay for school <laughs> to me like the donors' mom and dad probably did. But you know, I actually did get my degree, but it was not easy because i was having a fun time there in college big time 47 says destiny is really good at regurgitating my economics 101 class very lame arguing in bad faith obviously on amphetamines or just in hinge uh kex for kavanaugh says question destiny you say our dollars have to come back in the form of capital investments so destiny you can see that when we run trade deficits foreigners will take those dollars and use them to buy up our real estate and corporations how is that good <clears throat> foreign investment is good. It causes other countries to have like a higher interest in what goes on in the United States. And that foreign investment doesn't always mean they get controlling shares of said companies as well. Just because that foreign, just because money comes back in the form of foreign investment doesn't mean they're all of a sudden getting majority majority shares in every large company that they invest in. And it can also be used to buy goods and services as well. Why, why shouldn't Americans control those? Why, why do we, why, what kind of country is this? That we sell our vital infrastructure to foreigners, even if it's just some shares. Because by by, by the virtue is, of comparative advantage, we we get more goods and, and services by trading with other countries. Increase yeah, in liberalization trades. What about, what about well, that aren't the GDP? Wait, wait, We're not wait, talking wait, about things that are just GDP. We're talking about being able to afford shit like food, or being able to afford a fucking car, or being able to afford a computer. Maybe these are things you've never worried about. Before? We did it. We didn't have computers and shit before. We didn't have cell phones before. What do you mean? How did a country that was always protectionist like the United States of America, where it was illegal, believe it or not, in the 19th century for foreigners to own shares in American companies, how did that country feed its population? Well, I don't care. what. If you want to go back to the beginning of the 19th century, those stock buybacks that you hated so much, those weren't just legal. Those were literally required by the American government so that, so that com uh, companies were— so the companies well, we're not about No, I know, but like, here. if you want to go back to the 19th century and, 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 and talk about econ policy, like, America didn't always have things right. I, I mean, like, you hate stock buybacks. That used to be fucking law. That was I'm a not, mandate. I, so I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm not, see, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. I'm saying, how did the country feed its population when foreigners, when, when the Chinese or whatever, weren't shareholders in all these companies? How did they? Because you said, oh, these things, they, they help you buy food and they, 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 they help you, they help you get because of services. So what I would say is, how did it feed its people back then if foreigners were not allowed to buy shares in American companies? Because you made the a year, claim, sure, I'm yeah, I did make the back. claim. The year is 2020, yeah. and our goal for success uh, is not simply, fee yeah, the current year. In the current you, you know, year, you know, you know, can you I know, answer you know the fucking question? Actually, Holy I mean, shit. I can, I can, okay, I'm just going to keep talking and hope oh, that he shuts let, the fuck up. Yeah, so, our bar for success, yeah, so our bar for success is not just feeding our fucking people. That's the dumbest fucking bar I can possibly think of. You were the one that brought that up. No, right, no, no, it's not, no, 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 it's not just about feeding ourselves. people. It's the idea that lower cost of goods, like for food, allows even poor people to buy things like cell phones or computers or cars. more expensive now than it was right. 30 years ago, bro. Then how are we able to afford things? Then how are we able to afford things like cell phones and cars? Now. Well, Guys, cheap trinkets are cheaper, sure. Cheap trinkets, like access to the internet, that's just a cheap trinket to you? Dude, the internet was, okay, let's go, come on. Okay. All right. Uh, Ted Wang says, Fed strikers here to make Nazis look stupid. King Porgy says, reminder that Destiny claimed that lobbyists don't affect policy. By the way, that was one of that was a point that uh, I've seen repeated. So I want to give you a chance to address that. Yeah, so when you actually look uh, into the group. yeah, so when you actually get into the research for like how much lobbying impacts policy, if you look at how much is at stake with the U.S. economy, this is a twenty trillion dollar economy. The amount of money actually spent lobbying is like hilariously small. Like I think in two thousand and eighteen, Exxon 
ExxonMobil posted profits in excess of like $40 billion, they spent like $10 million lobbying. This idea that lobbying this highly is this highly profitable venture that a lot of these companies get involved in is just not borne out by any I research. Don't, I didn't say anything about ExxonMobil lobbying. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Are they not owned by Jews? I'm sorry. I mean, we could we no. could compare the amount of money that <laughs> Facebook is is spending, and then I compare never, that to I, their revenue as well. I never said that the that the energy industry was owned by Jews. I never said that. Okay. I, I mean, well, whatever company you're talking about is owned by Jews. The amount of money they spend on lobbying is hilariously small. Yeah, like, this idea like, that you get uh, these massive returns on your money for lobbying is just not true. There have been yeah, a couple like, of like like, like 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 Wall Street investment banks. Yeah, sure, bro. They don't fucking spend a shit ton of money. <laughs> On politics. Well, wait, how, wait, wait, which Wall Street, like, how, which ones are we talking about that we think spent all this money on lobbying? Okay, we can look it up. You, 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 yeah, go ahead and look it up. I'm not talking about lobbying. I'm talking about political donations. You're going to sit here and, and say investment bankers don't donate to our politicians. Go look at fucking how much money Hillary Clinton got from Wall Street, bro. Are you fucking out of your now, mind? And let me, I, I just want to give you a chance to respond, Destiny, because I've seen this repeated and it is, I mean, it's it's something that you said. Or, wait, wait, or oh my God, can, can I just real quick. So, do lobbyists affect things, I guess, would be, you know. Not, you not, how do they, they do it if they don't? I, well, I, they, I, they, I won't say just, that. That's just I, I, I the thing. Listen, that's wait, just wait, the wait, thing. wait, wait. They don't wait, wait, really wait, wait, do wait. it. Wait, I don't. I don't want to interpret. I'm just saying that that's a talking point that has come out from your last appearance on the show. That oh, Destiny said lobbyists don't matter; they don't affect so, policy. I I just want to give you a chance. Yeah. To so just that. yeah. So yeah. So real quick, the net earnings of Goldman Sachs was 10.46 billion dollars in 2018. They spent three million lobbying. Like these companies don't spend all that much money. Like, yeah, the numbers sound big to us. Oh my God, millions of dollars. But when you talk about the overall size of the US economy, $20 trillion in GDP, when you talk about the total revenues of these companies that are you know, in, in excess of hundreds of billions or, or tens of billions, they don't really spend that much money lobbying. I wonder why. Maybe it's because the returns on that lobbying aren't as super hyped up as a lot of people say that they are. Now the alternate argument is it's really cheap to buy our politicians. I mean, that would be. Uh, but if that was know. the case, if that was the case, then you would expect every new startup that pops up to just dump a ton of money into this like rent seeking, like lobbying behavior. It just doesn't happen. Um, like for for every one lobbyist that's Wall, working, Wall Street gave Hillary Clinton. This is uh, from CNBC. They gave her twenty seven million dollars. In 2016, 27 million dollars, and what are their total prop? Wall Street profits are probably in the excess of what, like, a, like over 500 what, billion. What, what? Well, it's like Ralph said, Hillary Clinton will will sell her sell her political pussy. Nah, don't put cheap. it on me. I'm being all devil's right, advocate. Right. I just want to put. No, the, no, no. Uh, well, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yes. what I'm saying is that uh, Hillary Clinton will just sell out for 27 million dollars. I mean, what, what, what's I mean, what's like the, Bernie the big, Sanders himself raised happened? like 20 million dollars, like in a single fucking month. Like the idea that this is enough money to you turn an election is just stupid. Listen. It just isn't borne out in any data. It doesn't make any you don't sense. Why? So why do they do it? Why do they give the money then? The reason why you give the money is because you're providing epistemic resources to your politicians in order to show them like, hey, this is how like these types of impacts or this is how this type of legislation impact us. And these are the arguments that you should or shouldn't make your constituents. The idea is that you're, you're exactly agreeing. No, you're, no, no. You're There's a huge difference between to donating this. Their no, you, you pay them because you think that they'll probably already agree with your position and you're just providing facts. So, for instance, let's say that like, uh, let's oh say that, God, let's say that. Bro, oh, this is a terrible hill to die on, man. It, it, well, no, for anybody, terrible. sure. So real quick, I, I won't terrible give this argument. Terrible. If anybody's interested, you should just go and Google, like, how much money do these companies make? How much is spent on lobbying? What's the size of the U.S. economy? The, the answers will shock you. It's, it's like, you know, right. if, if, you know, if, if, right. if you're paying, it's like saying I have a million dollars, but it only costs ten thousand dollars to do this. Uh, you know, that means, I, you know, if, if to bribe a politician, local, say, like, I want to bribe someone, right? And I pay them ten thousand dollars in a Manila envelope, and then you say, "But that bribe doesn't mean anything because you have ten million dollars." Like it, it, the 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 reasoning there is 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 ridiculous. Like why the would they give Hillary Clinton? Why would anyone give Hillary Clinton twenty seven million dollars? Why wouldn't politicians bribe? Why, would, why wouldn't politicians like fish for much higher bribes with so much at stake? With so much of the U.S. economy at stake, you think these people are going to settle for you know a couple million dollars? It doesn't make any well, sense. I mean. Well, how are prices set? I mean, it's just they. This is what they charge. I mean, I, you, you, you ask. Why don't you ask Hillary Clinton about why she charges so cheap? Well, it's for, probably for not a matter of what they charge. It's probably just that's how much it costs to develop the relationships that you need with these Congress people to provide resources for them when they go to make their decisions. Okay, well, so that's exactly what I'm saying, and so you're just admitting. Okay, language. cool. And I'm saying that lobbies probably support politicians that are already mostly in line with their opinions anyway. They're just and that's providing exactly our... what I'm saying. Oh, cool. Okay, so they're right. not actually changing their opinions at all. They're just supporting people that no, are already. Okay, they're cool. They're not changing. I'm opinions. glad we they agree. No, you they, just said we agree. They, I agree. They find, What's the next find, thing, what they do is they, they find people that already agree with them and they give them a lot of money so they get elected. 
That's what they do. And that's exactly right. what a political donation is supposed to do. And the only difference between America and some third world hellhole where they give money under the table is that we actually make the, the, the bribes public. That's really the only distinction here, bro. OK, because if you were to give Hillary Clinton twenty seven million dollars off the record in a third world country, you would call that a bribe. Right. But if it's in America and it's on, you know, on open secrets, then no, no, it's actually this actual long winded explanation uh, that generally goes so you, around the block. Yeah. So do you think all lobbying should be illegal? I am. Do you think all lobbying should be illegal? Won. Yeah, I mean, right. it's just stupid. Go ahead. Say that again. No, I'm curious. Do you I think that hear. all lobbying should be illegal? Yes. So let's say all, that all corporate and mm -hmm. banking lobbying and Zionist lobbying. Now, I'm not saying that people, advocacy groups, organic advocacy, community run advocacy. Actually, you know what? I think campaigns should just be publicly financed, you know, just like they do in other countries. Like, why is it in this country? We don't a have publicly that. financed campaign has nothing to do with lobbying. Lobbying and campaign contributions are two entirely different topics. political donations here. Why are you being Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You're conflating two total lobbying and like campaign contributions yes. are two totally different topics. Lobbying. Lot, lobbying and contributions are two different types of things. So then wait, things. so why are you complaining that I'm conflating them when you just conflated they, them? They're, they're two different types of things, but they're interconnected. No, okay? no, no, no. Because These if, are two. If, 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 no, no. Wall, Street, oh if Wall Street gives you $27 million oh. and then the Wall Street think tank or the Wall Street lobby comes up to and asks you for a favor, you're more willing to do that favor. So, I mean, it's all, it's symbiotic, okay? I don't Money know why you, why you because choose you can have, to die on because it's very stupid. It's not, no, it's not about a hill to die on. I ask, you're saying we should publicly fund elections. Right. That has nothing to do with lobbying. You can still have lobbying when elections are public. It doesn't have something funded. to do with political donations. Okay, but anyway. All right, let's, let, let's, let me read these oh, and we'll do another segment and then I'll let you guys go if you want to. I mean, we can say however long you want, but uh, Cherry Fos All right, it's up to you guys. Cherry Phosphate says Ted Wang should debate Destiny. I mean, hey, you know, I oh, like yeah. entertainment, so I'm not you against should that. Debate Her Weinstein with him. Herbert Silvatici says, "How did Ethan Ralph know its repatriations uh, concerning money and press?" Well, actually, uh, contrary to popular belief, I'm not an idiot. Uh, so <laughs> subtle energy yes. overnight. <laughs> subtle energy over 9,000 says 26% for 27% against 46% undecided hashtag media biased. Uh, Justin KG says 46% undecided, but both parties support Israel. 100% arcade outpost says there's not a lot. Most people wouldn't do for 27 million. Herod Silva TG says donations are to quote, provide resources for them question uh then he says to eric how do you stop astroturf campaigns yeah if you want to well that's a big problem in a in a plutocracy like america you just can't i mean the only the, the, the one advantage that we've had in in the 2016 election is that small donations blew up because of more campaigning done over the internet because you see the jewish run media will block candidates they don't like they'll they'll attack them they'll smear them and so people can we used to be able to campaign directly, bring the message to the people on the internet. That's how Donald Trump was able to win by a narrow margin. Uh, uh, but yeah, AstroTurf campaigns are just, it's just how, how America works right now. And that's why our, we have such a crisis of democracy where we keep voting for things. We voted for Donald Trump. He won the election to stop immigration and it simply hasn't happened. And that is a problem. Okay. That's unresponsive government. You know, Donald Trump wanted to uh, confirm uh, Chris Kobach or uh, the other guy, uh, Cuccinelli. And he couldn't confirm them because the Senate Republicans won't confirm them. The Senate Republicans won't confirm them because their their donors don't want an immigration hardliner in the government. So this is a big problem, okay? All right, wait, wait, why didn't... Did, I'm just curious. Why didn't the Jews support ahead, Bernie sorry. Sanders? I mean, you know, the, the, look, 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 before I answer that, let me just say one thing, Destiny. The, the the problem people like you have the reason why you will always lose a debate with an anti-semite is because you don't you don't accurately you don't accurately actually fight what we say like it's not to say every single jew all over the place is involved mm -hmm. in a conspiracy only the ones selectively the, that fit your conspiracy the best i know bro no it's just about it's just about people okay. using money mm -hmm. in a way that is a clear pattern okay like if i see two billionaires mm -hmm. that are the top donors of the Republicans and the Democrats who are Israel hawks, both yeah. of them are. And then I see the Republicans and the Democrats become Israel hawks. Mm -hmm. That's a pattern, right? Isn't Bernie more open so, borders than Biden? Why wouldn't they throw a bunch of money at Bernie? Well, they, that's true. But the, pro the problem is Biden 
is almost he has a pretty shitty immigration policy actually like people bernie's is just insane but and actually probably helped yeah, so why don't they the support election. bernie if like money is so easy like because, biden spent 15,000 or something Ber- I'll, I'll tell I'll tell you it's actually quite interesting the relationship they have to bernie so uh-huh. the media doesn't hate bernie personally they don't like some of his policies like medicare for all they don't like the jews i'm saying they don't like the wealth tax idea because of course if you tax wall street you know how are all these jewish donors going to be able to have the money to buy politicians how are they going to be able to to influence uh various things that with with their think tanks how are they going to be able to use their money in nefarious ways which they do uh so that's true about burning immigration and but the thing is if you look at uh Jewish statistics, Jewish voters, they didn't like Bernie because they don't like his supporters. They see Bernie as a destabilizing force because his supporters represented a form of white populism. Okay. It was at least in 2016. In 2020, it was, he lost the Wait. election because he lost the white Bernie populism. Bernie literally energy. led with support with Hispanics. What do, you, what do you mean by this? Sure, but that's because he raised a lot of money. He outspent every other candidate in Nevada, for example, in Spanish language ads by a lot, actually. I think it was like eight yeah, million. Yeah, but other places something. where he outspent, he lost hard with Hispanics uh, against Biden. So, so, I mean, like, so you're saying, so you're saying that? Okay, here's the thing. The point is, so w- which one are w- which point are you making? Are you making that he won the Hispanic vote, or are you w- making the point that he didn't win the Hispanic? Which, which I'm point saying that he had before, before or... all of the before all of the elections started to roll around. He had massive support among Hispanics, but you're telling me that he was unpopular right. with Jews because he was like had white populism or whatever. It didn't seem like his populism was very racialized. Or, or where did that idea come from? I guess? Well, that's not what the Jews in 2016 thought. That's where the term Bernie Bro. If you look at the origins of the term Bernie Bro, it was created by a Jew named Robinson Meyer in 2015 where he saw all these kind of like very very white audiences coming out for bernie's kind of socialist revolutionary anti-establishment message now if you look at if you pay attention on how the media covers bernie sanders you'll see that they don't usually attack him personally like they do with trump what they do instead is they attack his followers. Remember, the big controversy before Bernie was thro- was beaten in the, in the primary was look at the toxic Bernie bros or look at how these sexist, misogynistic, and even racist Bernie bros are operating and, and talking about people. And Bernie actually came out and he condemned his own supporters. So, you know... I thought uh, the term Bernie say, bro was inspired by the term Obama boys. That didn't just originate with Bernie that, bro. I thought that was a Hillary campaign thing. That no, it was it was invented by uh, again a guy named Robinson Meyer in a 2015 article in the Atlantic, where he specifically describes Bernie bro as white and male in a negative way. He personifies them as that. Okay. And he says they're white guy, men. This guy that's doing it as a Jew is racism and all this kind of shit. And this right, guy that's ahead. doing it as a Jew is like representing Jewish interests when he does it here, right? I'm saying the pattern, okay? There's a pattern that Jewish people tend to dislike white people, okay? That's Wait, the pattern. okay, I'm, so I'm curious. How do you reconcile the fact that, like, Jews have been outmarrying more and more and more, if that's the case, if they don't like that, like, Jewish women... Who are they outmarrying? Is there's, there's a difference. Let me, let, me, let's, let me explain that very carefully to you. So Jews have a hive. It's called Israel, okay? The birth rate in Israel is the highest in the industrialized world. There's three with atheist couples not secular atheist jews and like six or seven with religious jews so they're 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 pumping Jew- the jewish population has actually grown significantly in the last 20 years so the whole idea of out marriage who are they out marrying jared kushner out marrying the trumps guess what a jew is going to take all of that trump fortune one day how about a jew marrying into the clintons wait so, so how, how, how many times can you marry out before you're not considered a jew anymore like let's say that like you're jewish and then you marry do, and then they have a kid and then that do, person marries a non-jew like do you still consider that person is a they, jew is they, is they marry they marry wealthy and elite gentiles and they use their power fortune and name to later uh, for their own interests because a person who's half jewish is more likely to be pro-israel to be anti-white and to be a, a member of a Jewish community or, or loyal to the Jewish community than a person who's zero percent Jewish. That's not even up for debate. Well, yeah, I'm just curious so, if like the Jew gene is that like dominant or recessive or how I'm just 
Well, the way they typically do it is they outmarry for one or two generations and then they repurify their blood. I mean, there's no hard science on this. Yeah, wait, I'm curious. What does that mean? Purify your blood? Like, do you like genetically modify your baby to only carry the Jewish genes? Is this like solid snake and liquid snake? Or we, we, uh, I'm admittedly, when it comes to like some of this stuff, I'm admittedly out of my depth, and so are you. What I'm saying though is that when Jews outmarry, they outmarry usually elite Gentiles. Not, I mean, of course, it's not 100 percent of the time. Do you think it's just it's more reasonable usual. to say that like wealthy people tend to marry other wealthy people? Like, don't you think it's a little bit easier to say than to try to draw this weird conspiratorial Jewish sure, marrying when, rich when, people when, to when, recapture sure, the wealth through purification wealthy, of their wealthy, Jewish blood later? When, when, when a member of the Chabad Lubavitch, like Jared Kushner, I don't know if you know the philosophy of the Chabad Lubavitch, they don't even consider Goyim to be human. So if Jared Kushner, a loyal member of the Chabad Lubavitch, will make a, an exception for uh, Donald Trump's daughter and potentially inherit Donald Trump's billions, even though he's a billionaire already, you can't possibly dismiss that. Because usually when rich people, when rich families marry one another, it's seen almost like a, a royal mm-hmm. wedding, right? Well, so I'm just curious, is there like, what is this conversation is- like with your dad when he's like, I'm sorry, son, it's time to repurify the Jewish bloodline. Like, you have to find a Jewish wife, and she can't be like, I impure, don't know like, the actual internal dynamics. Like a bar I'm just saying thing? that the, Jew- the Jewish population in the world is growing. So, you know, it's, it's grown it's from like, I think Jew- from Israel. It's grown from huh? like 5 million to like 8 million, but okay. Um, but it's still growing. So the out marriage I mean, thing isn't is is not a, a, a an existential problem for them. Okay. okay? It just seems so, weird for people that are like obsessed with like the purity of their fucking Jewish genes or whatever. But I, okay, I don't know. It's just interesting to hear. Jews, that. Jews are nuanced uh, thinkers. Like they 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 understand as a minority that they have to make some some sacrifices and 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 some some exceptions in many cases. But, you know, if, if you or I, Destiny, mm-hmm. try to go to a synagogue and say, I want to convert to Judaism, I want you to try that someday, Destiny, yeah. the rabbi will say no. But if, if, if a Trump says, I want to convert to Judaism to marry into Chabad Lubavitch, then suddenly the rabbi says yes. So you got to ask your local rabbi why that is, Destiny. Okay. That, that, that's not something I can answer. I don't know what okay. the exact dynamics are. I'm willing to bet there, there are probably a lot of... Marry elite. Sure, it's, it may, it's, in your, it's in your interest to marry into elite. You know, look at, for example, the Spanish royals. The Spanish royals actually intermarried, uh, even though they, they, they didn't... They, they, they discouraged uh, Spaniards from marrying Indians, uh, which is true, the caste system. They did... The, the, the royals actually have... Uh, the, the same uh, a distant ancestry from uh, the the Aztec emperor. Okay, so th- this is kind of what elites do, and it's true that all elites do it to some extent. But with Jews, it's especially interesting because they still retain their ethnocentrism. The Trumps do not. That's the distinction. Jews retain. Well, they they, they, they retain it in like your weird definition of whatever the fuck repurifying your bloodline means. I don't, I don't know how you even possibly. Could I don't think know. That would work, but well, like I said, I'm I'm not an expert in how Jews do this. Or I mean, it sounds like of all the things you brought up, this is the thing you know the most about. So it's kind of surprising that you wouldn't know like how you go about repurifying the Jewish bloodline after like you've been marrying well, out after, of your group for longer well, and longer. What they, what they see it is how, you know, if, if the way they would see it is that after several generations, they they're, they have minuscule amounts of Gentile blood. But the Chabad Lubavitch is a highly racialist organization. They do not consider Jews to be just a religion. They are highly racial. And they do not accept Gentiles as converts. Go call your local Chabad Lubavitch and say, I'm a Goy and I want to convert to your sect. They will tell you to fuck off. Okay. Okay, sure. All right. Anyway. Um, so let's do one more segment, even though <laughs> that was basically the segment that I thought. Anyway, uh, let me read these. One more topic. I'll let both of you guys go. Uh, let's see. John John says, why does striker mix stupid shit with smart shit? Static says it was only 20. It's only $27 million, bro. Studio IKN says, will we ever get another destiny versus Medicare? I don't know. Uh, Tyrone 88 says, Jimmy Chang plans on streaming again. King Porgy says, what's an Obama boy. Excuse me. That's new to me. Herod Silva Titi says, Ethan Ralph is a serious political slash economic analyst masquerading as a good old gamer boy. Prove me wrong. Arcade Outpost says five million to eight million. You say, hmm. 
Ted Wang says neo Nazis are drunken, low IQ nerds. Bring in Nick. All right, now let's do the final segment. Whatever topic you guys want to do it let's, on. Let's finish this off with a topic I know uh, Destiny's been reading a lot about because someone someone actually sent me a clip. Destiny, if you you said you were talking about Richard Evans lying about Hitler and the Holocaust and uh, Hitler and, and World War II and things like that, you were brushing up on that. I'm sure you're very uh, studious. Not very so, serious. I just learned, like, through that trial that there's no reason to ever talk about people that, like, can, can, like try to lie about what's in the archives because people go to great lengths to misrepresent what exists there. Mm-hmm. That's a book that I recommend to everybody to read, by the way. It's called well, me, Lying me, About uh, Hitler. Uh, it's by uh, John Evans. He's the expert witness historian. It's Richard Evans, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's the uh, expert witness historian that was brought in to testify um, uh, basically against— um, uh, David Irving or whatever about all of his misrepresentations of stuff uh, related to Hitler and, and his existence. Oh, so you read the book, yeah? Yeah. You read the book? Okay. So there's a part in that book, because of course, you know, Richard, uh, David Irving, uh-huh. there's, there's a lot to talk about David Irving, but I, I'm not, I don't want to get too into it, but I will say this. Many historians, when that trial was happening, were saying that their work would not be able to survive that kind of scrutiny. Remember, they paid <laughs> millions of dollars for top-tier researchers to look through every single thing he's ever written and find little little things like, oh, you didn't interpret this right. So, but the problem is though, is that the judge in the in David Irving case actually said that there are still significant questions about the Holocaust. And in retrospect, Richard Irv- Richard Evans's book hasn't aged that well. So there's a part in Richard Evans's book where he declares that Majdanek is a homicide gas chamber camp. Remember, uh, this this um, this camp. Majdanek. So, uh, do, do, are you familiar with this? Nope. Okay. So I am familiar with Majdanek, the statements you've made thus far, though, and I know that both of them are false. But we, you can go on. Majdanek was actually the first. It was the first Holocaust concentration camp. And what I mean by that is that it was the first one that the, the Soviets uh, liberated, quote, liberated. And they found a bunch of empty cans of Zyklon B and a bunch of uh, showers and stuff. And they said, we believe that Jews were gassed here in mass. Uh, the, the numbers are actually uh, quite astonishing. They said originally that at Majdanek, 1.5 million people were gassed, killed by, by, by Nazi extermination chambers. So now, to 2020, uh, Destiny, uh, do you think that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is a, is a, is a good source like a like a source you can believe for in regards to what in regards to holocaust history sure probably reasonably so yeah yeah they've declared they have a little footnote on their page Uh about the death camps where they say that actually not only did 1.5 million people not die there uh, 1.3 million i'm sorry this is a, a number by the way invented by a jew named lucy davidovitz who took it from soviet propaganda uh, but not only did, did is this number bullshit, the, the real number is actually, uh, according to the Majdanek Museum now, 78,000. But there were no homicidal gas chambers at Majdanek. So doesn't that kind of, let's say, beg the question as to whether, you know, if, if for, for, for decades they held that Majdanek was an extermination camp, it was the first one the Soviets used for, in their propaganda. Doesn't that beg, doesn't that bring up questions about the other camps where there's no evidence of any killings or with gas chambers? Like, does so you know. I, I don't know the specific and it camp, also, yeah. so, and wait, wait, okay, 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 let's chill, let's chill, let's chill, let's chill. Wait, 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 come on, you just got to do JQ shit for like two hours. Okay. So let's let's go through some of the claims you said. So Richard Evans specifically addresses that quote that you used, where a lot of people said that researchers um, were afraid that their own research couldn't survive the scrutiny that Irving's research went under. Now, there are a lot of general historians that read some of the footnotes of the trial that didn't follow the trial specifically that made statements like that, but Evans very carefully dissects every single one of these statements and absolutely blows it the fuck out of the water. The problem wasn't that Irving accidentally mistranslated or accidentally misrepresented something once or twice. The problem was that he consistently overestimated in areas where it benefited Hitler and underestimated in areas where it benefited Hitler, and that was a pattern that went through constantly that was an undercurrent of all of his work. He would consistently recognize documents like the, it's like TB84 or whatever, that everybody knew was a fraud, that he even initially said was a fraud, and then, you know, 20 years later was still citing it as being true. He consistently mistranslated things that were favorable 
helpful to Hitler. He consistently ignored some documents that were inconvenient. He overestimates things like the amount of people killed in the Dresden bombings to an atrocious manner using very vague documents. That, like All of this stuff was a consistent pattern in his work that showed a clear... I think, I think, I think it's interesting that... Oh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 chill, chill, chill. I know it's interesting that he fucking married, a fucking has like a daughter that's a Jew or some shit. I don't give a fuck, okay? But it is very clearly what? all laid why, out why in all the court transcripts. Like well, because you're, you're like, you're interrupting me after you just talked like some random conspiracy shit for like 10 fucking million, or, or for 10 fucking minutes, okay? So he very consistently goes through and points out in all of the parts where Irving deliberately and with clear malice mistranslates passages to be favorable towards Hitler or cites things from the archives that are very clearly uh, not very reliable in order to try to make claims that nobody agrees with. So this idea that all research is, is, is just as easy to scrutinize as Irving's, Evans very clearly specifically denies it in a book and gives a compelling reason to believe so. The idea that the judge said that there are major issues that are unresolved with respect to the Holocaust, that is just not true. Now, if we want to say that there are things that historians could quibble about, not only are there things that they can quibble about, they do to this day. There are plenty of historians that do a lot of work in regards to debating about what goes on exactly related to the Holocaust. Those debates are not related over whether 6 million Jews were killed or 150,000 Jews were killed. No serious historian has ever made or defended any of those extreme claims made by revisionists that, one, don't engage with any of the current literature, and two, a lot of the time can't even fucking read German when they pretend that they go through the archives to cite things related to this stuff. All of this work in revisionist history relies on citing these documents that they hope people never check out. Half the time, these footnotes lead to nowhere, or they're just footnote citing like an entire fucking book or something, and then most of the time, the translations are either wrong or taken out of context. So no, the idea okay. that the judge said that there were unresolved issues, that is a mischaracterization of what the judge said, which is why Irving lost that trial, and the idea that people's research wouldn't stand with that scrutiny, that's something that Evans himself specifically trial, rejects trial. as well which okay. is not true well, me, also this idea answer. the idea let that like 1.3 million jews like may have died and so i don't know specifically the death camp that you're talking about but i know that people have constantly tried to attack the, the millions of jews that were killed in these places and it's just laughable like we have records and archives of these people these, these were not like fucking countries from like fucking 12,000 bc where we have no records of any of these people the idea that like magically oh, five yeah, million no people of Hitler given any orders for it the, that's funny. Yeah, there, maybe not a written one, but the idea that yeah. all of this was happening under Hitler's nose when Hitler himself specifically no, no, ordered people, when Hitler himself when Hitler himself specifically not, not one order when Hitler himself because it was a very clear policy that they had to not give those specific orders. But commanders that met Who's with a Hitler conspiracy theorist now. The, Who's a conspiracy theorist now? Probably the guy that that's those, not denying that a country okay, that had well, a very me, racialized policy me, that literally invaded other countries like Austria Hungary and literally told them to kill all of their fucking Jews. What do you think that this was happening and Hitler had no fucking idea? Like how naive do you think he was? Let, like all of these people let, that were close let, to Hitler, like uh, very clearly were relaying orders that they were given from him what? directly. Yeah, then there's no there's no pay. you say, oh, we have all the documents and there's not a single fucking document to say that Hitler gave any orders like that, even though they have they have documents. The Nazi archives, if you're familiar with them, are extremely meticulous. Germans are very meticulous, meticulous yet, enough to also to every, every a literal written order. order. It's just not true. Everything, everything you're saying no, is no. just completely not true. Okay. Hitler, let, like let me, by let definition, me, by definition, answer, by me, definition me, Nazis did not answer, give explicit answer, commands let me, saying let me, murder the Jews. Let me, let me answer. Mm -hmm. Let me answer. Let, Let him get it. So, Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I, I'm not someone who has been paid for two for, for a year, millions of dollars to, to, to pour over uh, Mr. Evans's book attacking David Irving. Wait, do you think I yet, pay, wait wait are you claiming why don't that I'm you let me finish? That? Wait, wait, did you just claim that I'm being paid to go over why, Evans' why, book? No, I'm not saying that. Shut up. Right. Wait, what was the implication right. there? The implication is this. Let me finish. The the in, in his book. He says that hundreds of thousands of people were killed in homicidal gas chambers in a Polish concentration camp called, Pol uh, called Majdanek. Now, the Yad Vashem, the U.S. Holocaust Museum, say that actually no one was killed with gas at Majdanek. So if you want to talk about oversight, historical oversight, if you assert that all these people... Un unfathomable amounts of people were killed with poison gas in a camp. And then, 20 years later, people say, actually, this never happened. And, and you're telling me that Richard, Richard Evans is like this fucking, you know, absolute truth of history. You got to question that. That's the first thing. The second thing is that a lot of uh, the, 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 the David Irving, David Irving being an unreliable historian only happened after he wrote his book, 
say that his publishing company, Hitler's War, said, you got to tack something on about the Holocaust. David Irving said, well, I've poured through the archives. David Irving speaks like four or five languages, by the way. And, I, and by the way, I understand he's, he's uh, claims to change his opinion here. There, that, that's besides the point. I'm talking about this specific instance. David Irving poured through the archives while writing the book and said, I found no archive proof that there was a plan for the systematic extermination of poison gas of six million Jews. There's no proof of that. There's no orders. I mean, if, if you were to put this up in a fair court, not Nuremberg, but a fair court, it would get thrown out for lack of evidence. It's like accusing someone of murder. You, you realize then, that he literally tried to sue for libel in the most favorable court he could. There's a reason why he waited for it to happen, for that book to be published yes, and he, in, and the, was, in the UK. Was, hold on. Can I, can I finish? Sure. I mean, what you've said so Let, far is let's, just wrong. Let, let's, be fair. let's be fair to David Irving in his trial. David Irving represented himself. Okay. He, was, he didn't have the money to actually hire solicitors and, and, and people like that. Deborah Lipstadt got millions, I'm talking millions of dollars, to hire the, the best lawyers, the best researchers in Britain. Wait, whose fault is the reason that? that the, the, okay, Wait, no, 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 no. Whose hold fault is that? No, no. Who, who is responsible for this Destiny. trial? I, I understand. I'm not saying he's not. But what I'm saying Wait. is the, the, the point of the trial wasn't even to win the libel lawsuit. The point of the trial was to put the Holocaust on trial. Because remember, the, this, the, the only thing the judge, I believe his name is Judge Gray, uh, the only thing he found was that the, 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 the thing they definitively proved, proved in the eyes of the judge was that David Irving did have some prejudice against Jews. That's what they claimed they definitively proved. And they did, they did attack, but the problem is, uh, wait a second, when, wait a second. I'm just, in, in terms of what you said, so the point of this trial was to put the Holocaust on trial. Who's, whose point was that? Yes, that was David Irving. He, he didn't, he used the libel because you can't, you can't start a lawsuit against someone to, to fight the Holocaust. Yeah, but why, why would he cry? Why would you, you use the excuse? Use some kind of why would you excuse? use the excuse that he couldn't afford a lawyer when he's I'm the one saying, that brought I'm not the suit? I'm not saying, I'm not, Destiny, I'm not saying it's an excuse. I'm saying that if you have millions of dollars to hire the best legal team in the country and someone is, 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 is defending themselves in court, no, no, who's no. going to win that That's trial? I mean, you can be the most. Not, you can be the he most. He wasn't defending. You can be, you he can wasn't be defending the most himself. innocent man. No. You can be the most innocent man in the world, and if you're in a in a court and you don't have a lawyer, you're fucked. It's I mean, so even crazy you how many people just miss this. And it's funny. The reason why you don't understand this is because he got crushed so hard. He was the plaintiff in that case. He wasn't the I defendant. Understand. So he I can't. Understand. No, no. So you can't say, well, they had so much money for lawyers. He's the one that brought the suit. Like, do you know why? Do you understand why? Yeah, because he thought he could win because he thought the UK courts would be more favorable no, to him than America. Yeah, no, exactly. It, That's the stated reason. No, he thought, yes, it reason, is. Hold on. The reason he did it, the reason he did it, let me explain this very carefully. The reason he did it was because Deborah Lipstadt was publishing books calling him an anti Semite and a Holocaust denier. Wrong. She had that as a passage of a book that sold less than like ten thousand copies. I, I understand, and that and was Irving okay, has me, a can huge I, can history. Can I finish, dude? You're just can you're just making shit point? up. No, I can't let you excuse because it. this is what you guys do. For, so, no, no, you're trying excuse to present me. Irving in excuse such a, a in such a pathetic excuse light. Excuse me, it's excuse such me. bullshit. I don't care. I don't. I don't have a good or bad opinion about Irving personally. He's not. He's not my best buddy or anything. I'm just telling you what happened. This is. Let me just finish, and then you can say what you want point of the, the point of the case again you're making this about david irving i want to talk about the 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 actual facts in the holocaust i don't care about david irving or who he married or who he has kids with that's for fucking women okay you can fucking debate that with other women if you want what i'm saying is that the point of the lawsuit was deborah lipstadt was calling him names and was saying that he's a liar and that he's an anti sem a liar motivated by anti-semitism but she would refuse to have a discussion with him where he would put his facts against hers. She had a specific no-platform policy for Holocaust revisionists, which you can agree or disagree with. So he saw it as clever, probably a bad idea in retrospect. I agree with you. He thought it would be clever to say, I'm going to force Deborah Lipstadt to debate me. 
and she can bring all of her hollow hoaxers to the fucking court and I will destroy their points, which he actually did. The very famous, there's a very famous quote that came out of that. No holes, no Holocaust. When he questioned the mechanism, questioned the top Holocaust historian on the mechanism of how these, the, according to the blueprints that he found, the, the original blueprints of Auschwitz gas chambers, how it was possible for them to feed the gas pellets and how they were able to do this when the blueprints did not support the assertion of Holocaust affirmers, of Holocaust conspiracy theorists. How did this work? There's engineering involved in that that is physically impossible, which is why today, Destiny, today, increasingly, you can say revisionists don't matter, but the only reason they gave up on Madonna is because revisionists kept pushing it. Okay, the so, only okay, reason okay, they so admitted, wait, wait, so real quick, because you've made like 20 claims, I can't just let you rant, I can't let you just like rant past a whole bunch of bullshit. That the Holocaust Wrap gas chamber that they show you at Auschwitz mm -hmm. won. The only Every they single time that it's a phony for tourists is because Robert Farrison exposed this in Lex Express in the 1970s. Okay, so you can dismiss Holocaust. Sure, they're personally attacked. Holocaust revisionists, when they were in their heyday in the 1970s and 80s, were beaten. Their 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 offices were firebombed. They were there was assassination attempts. The Mossad put a car bomb outside of someone's house. Clearly, there was something they didn't want people to hear. Gotcha. And so every single time in this trial, when Irving was forced to, to defend ground, some contention that he made in his book, talk he had to walk back from it every single time. When he brought up the idea that nobody was actually driven out in a van and gassed, when Evans push, pushed him on it, every single time he was pushed on one of these issues, he had to walk back from it and concede that he was absolutely full of shit. When you try to bring up these little weird facts about the blueprints not fitting, about the idea that the holes couldn't actually fit enough people in it, all of this was bullshit That's napkin not math that not only had Evans done, he walked back from when he was pushed consistently. And in terms of what the judge found, the judge literally said that Irving had his own ideological reasons for persistence Consistently and deliberately misrepresenting and manipulating historical evidence related to what Hitler. About and he, he, uh, whoa, 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 stop. Why are we pivoting? You just talked for 20 minutes. Reason. We just talked for 20 minutes. Calm down, buddy. The judge also said that he found that Irving was an active Holocaust denier, that he was anti-Semitic and racist, and that he associated associated with right-wing extremists. This was doled out over hundreds and hundreds of hours of in-court testimony. All of it is available. You can read the book. You can go over the testimony. Irving fucking you can read the himself. actual judge's Irving, decision Irving. where he said there are serious questions about the Holocaust that remain open. Sure, that's, that's fine. No, no, but this is the thing that you Holocaust so revisionists do. So just because there are serious questions, just because there are serious questions, questions where things are open here. doesn't mean that they're willing to say, oh yeah, maybe only 150,000 Jews died, not 6 million. I of course there are serious questions. Not only are there serious questions still open it, actual historians, real historians, not hacks like Irving, actually have active debates about this all the time. Why was David Irving, why was David Irving a a highly respected historian before he wrote. He wasn't. Work. He was only a highly respected historian by people that did a general overview of his work and never actually followed the footnotes. It's one of the things that Evans did that he got so much praise for in the no trial. No one even knew when Dresden you actually, happened when you actually, before his When you book. actually follow the footnotes and you actually look at where his sources read to, what you find out is that Evans is a massive fucking fraud. So if you look, and it's funny because at the end of the book, all yeah, of these Evans historians that you would right. be so excited to cite actually do come out and say, like, well, Evans does good work. You know, his, the, the, the military history or whatever of Germany, he did good work here, but when you actually find people that specialize in that area, people that actually speak German and visited the archives in Moscow, in Washington, in Paris, in Berlin, and actually did the research, will all come out and unanimously say uh, Irving is a fucking hack and none of the work I, I that he love... did holds up to any type of critical analysis whatsoever. You can always find generalists that will praise the work of other generalists. How many generalists have come out in favor of, say, uh, uh, guns, germs, and steel? But when then you look at people that actually have like specific education in an area, come out and are critical of it. Like, the fact that you would even pretend that you could spin any part of Irving's history in work or any part of that trial in a favorable light shows that you were either completely unwilling to engage with what actually happened or you're being intentionally dishonest about it. Irving had to retreat from every single major claim that he made in that book. Yeah, you probably watched the movie. I don't think you actually... Let, let, let me just say this, okay? Wait, 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 I'm sorry, wait, part, hold on. Wait, did you actually read the book? Yes, I did. I've, I've read the book so, twice, so actually. Tell me, so tell me which book, parts do you feel like I'm misrepresenting. It's interesting that you I said. already told you. I told you that. No, what I, what I, I didn't say that you're misrepresenting it. I'm saying that mm -hmm. there are things, there are gaping problems with Evans's assertions in that book. What that kind of US gaping Holocaust, problems? I explained this already. If no, no, no. no. Tell, me, tell, that, me, tell, me, tell me what kind of gaping problems Irving had. What do you think are his I problems? Said, Irving or Evans? 
Irving. I even think I even think uh, I mean Irving. Uh, I'm not going to talk about him personally, but I'm saying that the the what the judge found, what Judge Gray found in the Irving trial, was that David Irving was not libeled. It's not that the Holocaust, like the, the, the whole idea, like this wasn't in the trial, but the whole idea that David Irving has personal political motives, and he may, but somehow Deborah Lipstadt, who is a hardline Zionist, very active in the Jewish community, has connections with all the big Jews in Hollywood, like Steven Spielberg, who helped finance her, her, her lawsuit. Somehow Deborah Lipstadt, the Holocaust affirmer, has no personal political motive that people that write things affirming lies about the Holocaust. This had nothing. Dude, no, no, no. You can't no pivot to try to cry about Jewishness here. You always try to appeal to Jews and special I'm saying interests. That, this I'm was saying a court that, case that, 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 that a judge evaluated that, that, that Irving himself brought suit to. You don't get to run and hide and cry about the conspiracy theories because you don't like how why, fucking destroyed why? he got in court, dude. But whatever her associations were he are not relevant the, to the court case. It is. Full Boy, stop. I, I, End of discussion. I, you can't I'm bring saying, up her associations to try to save Irving's disastrous what, fucking history in writing or his disastrous fucking case in court. David, what I'm saying is that David Irving is a highly, highly, highly respected historian. No, no matter what your opinions are, or what the merits That's of his work. That's just not are. true. And it, it, this is why I know you didn't read the book because Evans millions, literally goes through at the end sold millions of copies of his books. Oh, on, so, on so Rommel, are you saying Sam Harris on, is a highly respected fucking philosopher now because he sold okay, millions of dude, copies on the I moral mean, landscape? Right. Like, what do you mean, dude? Come on, you're going to tell me that selling lots right, of I'm copies of a right. book makes you you're a respected really historian? Me. I would just say, I would just say, people look up Robert Ferrison if you're listening. Look up uh, the, the very right. first. Sure, Holocaust and I would say, scenario. you know, go ahead and read the book Lying about Hitler. You can see how these guys literally yeah. mistranslate right. German oh, documents. Oh, how they literally oh, lie about what the words say. How they literally try to weasel out of the. How the fact that this guy's trying to say the judge didn't give like an actual fucking opinion on this when the judge literally said and I quote it is my conclusion that no objective fair-minded historian would have serious cause to doubt that there were gas chambers at Auschwitz and that they were operated on a substantial scale to kill hundreds of thousands of Jews like the idea that you're going to sit here and pretend last, that thing. last thing before I go okay last thing just really no wait quick. we're going to do final statements but yeah go ahead last, you, last thing you... about this topic okay okay if you, if you want to steal liar look up Deborah Lipstadt. Okay, go on her website. Right. There's a there's a, after after Holocaust revision is exposed that the 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 gas chamber they show to tourists at Auschwitz is a fake. After this was exposed and they admitted to it, they admitted to it many many years in, in the 80s. They admitted that it was fake. Uh, Deborah Lipstadt said it's not fake. It's symbolic. So the point is that this was created constructed after the war. So the point I'm making here, just to end it, is that. The, the Holocaust affirmers, the Holocaust conspiracy theorists, they, they, they support putting so-called Holocaust deniers in prison. They support ruining their lives. They support physical violence against them in many cases. They support all of this, but it doesn't stop them from constantly giving ground. At this point, there, there's increasing pressure to start letting go of the idea of gas chambers in general in mainstream history. The numbers of six million are being reduced by mainstream Jewish historians as we speak. There's a book in 2016 that did this by a Jewish historian. In fact, now they're quickly and rapidly, and David Irving actually is doing this too, by the way, which is kind of shady. They're Now they're retrenching, they're pulling back the front line. Now the main claim they're making is that people were gassed in vans in the so-called Reinhardt camps. This is like basically their last bastion of Holocaust stuff. This is happening while we debate this, they're losing ground like crazy. People aren't mm -hmm. believing it anymore, and this is why they have to give ground. I mean, they, they were holding that people were being turned into lampshades and soap until the mm -hmm. Yad Vashem very recently admitted they weren't. So, you know, this is the point. And the people that exposed that first, by the way, those were revisionists that exposed that it was fake. So, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Destiny. Anyway, let's go. Yeah, Let so me wait, read these. Do I get to do my closing statement? Oh, I have to just real well, quick. I mean, I didn't know that that was the. I mean, that oh shit. Okay, well, yeah, I just yeah, have yeah. to respond real quick because this is everything okay. he said is just All not right. true. The idea that Go there ahead. are serious debates in academic communities, like dramatically revising down the number of Jews that were killed in gas chambers, it's just not true. Like, can you find a pop history book every now and then, like written by a guy that has zero engagement with any of the actual historical literature, or a guy that has no idea how to actually engage with history? Yeah, I'm sure we can find pop books written about fucking literally anything about history, about war 
wars, about philosophy. Um, you know, like tons of people do this all the time. In the actual academic communities where these debates happen, yeah, people quibble over what are the exact numbers of people killed in certain areas? How are these orders issued? How are they carried out? But there are no mainstream contentions about the idea that six million Jews were killed or that hundreds of thousands of people were killed across different death camps in different types of gas chambers. Um, and even this very specific idea that you bring up about people being gassed in vans, that was something that Irving had originally written about that he completely and totally retreated from in yes. the trial. And the text of him actually doing that is included in the in the final chapter of the book where he's being questioned about it and eventually concedes entirely to that point and then concedes that he lied about it and continued to lie about it in his book uh, past the point of knowing that it wasn't true. So pretty much <coughs> well, every single thing you just said about how there are widespread historian consensus saying that like, oh, well, they're actually dramatically revising the numbers and gas numbers. It's all complete bullshit. There are a couple uh, okay. of pop history books last written sentence. by people last, that aren't taken sentence. seriously last in historical sentence. communities that have no formal historical training and that last, don't engage critically last, with any historians whatsoever. Man, man who recently in 2016 re revised the number down from 6 million to 3 to 4 million is uh and which is still a big number i'm not saying but i'm just saying that this is a slow process that's how history against time and against the the, the grain works you know i'm i'm actually trained i'm actually a, a relatively trained historian what I does that mean you, I, I went to school for it so like what you're like an undergrad in I, history or what yeah i'm not saying i'm a historian per se but i have i did briefly work in the industry and so on but the Wait, point doing is what i'm not going to say too much about you're it, lying 100 percent. but go ahead Okay. So, God. Go okay. ahead, so anyway, David David Cesarini, oh. David Cesarini, <laughs> who's a, a British a British historian, in who specializes in Jewish history, especially the Holocaust. That's in his biography. That is the man who, in 2016, released the book revising the numbers down, okay, significantly, because you know going down from six million to three or four million is significant. He doesn't say the number, but that's what he adds it up to. So this man, and by the way, he passed away, but you can look him up, David Cesarini. It, this is his magnus. He, he's won National Jewish Book Awards for history. So if you're not going to take this man's word for it, no one's word is good enough for you, Destiny. So anyway, let's let's. All right, let's, let me read these. Who started off? Does does anybody remember? Because I don't. Who who had the first opening statement? I don't know. Just let me read these, and then we'll give yep. each person the finale. By the way, thank you guys for staying. Uh, so long uh camper tw and by the way i completely usually it's a trademark for me to be mostly hands-off but i just almost completely went hands-off for this and just let you guys go at it uh, i think it was pretty good actually uh camper 1260 says bring on ted wang i don't actually see wang and we're not going to get to any callers to be quite real with you guys uh scrub lord man says why is rich evans writing about the holocaust camper camper 1260 uh says wang uh, and then he says, this is now a Wang stream. Ted Wang himself says, talk about Rich Evans' view on Star Trek Picard. Uh, Camper1260 says, Ted Wang is winning this debate. Eddie Brav12 says, David Cole's David Cole Steins' research refutes Holocaust numbers. Arcade Outpost says, there are names of supposed killed that were alive. Herod Silvatici says, a certain... Uh, I don't know, chemical compound is a fumigant never put through pipes. Ted Wang says... Why Rich Evans doesn't like Picard is exciting. Then Ted Wang says, David Irving's view on Star Trek Picard, please. Herbert Silvatici says, uh, certain chambers would use CO2, much more efficient. Ted Wang says, which is better, the Holocaust or Star Trek Picard? Camper 1260 says, we want to hear what Ted Wang has to say. Uh, let's see. Camper 1260 then says, where's Wang? Uh, Camper 1260 says, where's Jim Object? Herbert Silvatici says World War II World War II historians relied slash rely on Irving's archi archivism or archivism. Uh, Arcade Outpost says curator of Auschwitz claims uh, recreations on camera. Camper 1260 says historian equals fed. AD user says imagine losing to a beta cuck. Wes the Great says they need to mass produce masks and sanitizer. Uh, let me look through here on the stream elements. Uh, let's see. Uh, where, Can you real um, quick? What was this book by Cicerini that where he massively revised down the numbers? I can't find anything it's about called, this. Um, hold on, let me see. Final solution: The fate of the Jews, nineteen thirty-three to nineteen forty-nine. All right. Uh, and Twig you're telling says me that ask... in, this, in this book he says that far fewer than six million Jews were killed. Yeah. Yes. I literally Twig can't says... find that anywhere. But sorry, go ahead. Twig says, "Ask Destiny about uh, his penchant for." I don't know. Incest, basically, whatever. If you want to answer that, yeah. I don't know. That's up to you. We've talked about incest. With you I don't want to know about your personal life. I don't want to. 
<laughs> no, nah, it's more of a philosophical discussion, quote unquote. We had this in what was it, December, well, maybe January? I'm sorry, yeah, real quick before we do more. So I, I'm looking this up. This guy never said that. You just completely fabricated that. David Cicerini never down uh, how many Jews were killed. Like, there's nothing on the internet about this at all. Like, let's, let's okay, buy the book. Uh huh. I'm look not going to buy a whole how... book and fucking read it right now for you. Like, if he was dramatically well, downgrading it, an asshole. If, he, if he would dramatically downgrade that if number, I should be able to find this instantly. Book, why are you telling me a book I read isn't true? Because like, it doesn't exist the on the book. internet. This number doesn't exist. You're lying. Oh, You're just lying. Like you have about almost every single source you've brought up this debate. Like people, like I see multiple people reviewing the book that mention the six million number. None of them seem to bring up that apparently he's got this dramatic revision downwards. This is like I wish that I knew what, every what fact you were bringing. Says, okay, which page Dave, do I need Dave, to look at? Let, which page? Let me. I, I actually have notes on this if you'd like to see them. Sure. Yeah. Which, uh, which page? Tell yeah. Tell me. One point five million Jews were shot on the Eastern Front, uh -huh. according to Cesarini. About nine hundred to nine sixty thousand were killed at Auschwitz, presumably, you know, he, he implies it's gas chambers. 1.7 were killed in the Action Reinhard camps, and then another about 100,000 at Kelmno. Okay. It's significantly less than So you million. went through the book and you did your own napkin math to figure out what you, what you think he would say was the total number of Jews okay. killed. All right, man. That's All what, right. Okay, just making Fire sure. That's book. what you did. Fire okay, so he didn't actually dramatically Fire revise anything. Fire Fire You're doing Nazi napkin math. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, go pirate right, the Blue book Tang. and tell me what you think. I'm not going to read a Blue whole Tang. fucking book to, to deal with some dumbass assertion that's very clearly not true because nobody on anywhere is fucking well, talking you know, about it. Right. Well, you know, even even if I convince you fully, Destiny, that that what I'm saying is true, you're still not going to admit it because you're a fucking coward and you have you make a living from lying to people about neoliberalism and all these crap because that's what that's why Jews let you let you do your thing, man. Yeah, that's so, why the Jews know, let me do. That's why Bezos himself is giving me a pat on the back for all my hard work. I think the oh, thing is, I think the funny thing is that, like, <laughs> if anybody, if anybody is the no, coward, it's actually yourself. you. Like, you're too scared you're to take a hard mean. look in the mirror to figure out what we need to do to fix society, <laughs> and instead, it's easier to just blame the Jewish fucking boogeyman, dude. Every one of you conspiracy theorists is the same way. You're too lazy to do any of the actual hard work into figuring out how can we make yeah. a better society, how can I improve my life. Instead, you just want to find one fucking boogeyman to blame everything right. on because you're too much of a fucking coward That's to look right. in the mirror and figure out what you can do to fix yourself. Like, exactly. Like, it's 100% what it is. Like this idea political, that a bunch of fucking white people counters, will get together and, and make counters, everything better is like laughably fucking here. naive dude asking how the nazis killed six million jews in a systematic fashion and not a single actual written order exists to do this in a fucking very well oiled and the idea the, military machine. and listen, conspiracy listen to you listen to you okay. you're telling me come that on. this conspiracy theory exists where jews around the world have all come together to control corporate media control shadow banking and all of this but you think it's unfathomable that hitler might have had like a personal decree not to literally write on a piece of paper show i want to kill show all me the jews an autopsy of, a, of a gas jew show me is there any autopsy proving that show me how the math works with the crematoriums we're well, seeing the I, most I, modern I, rec I recommend you the lying about Hitler book and then there are a million other resources that you can read about gas need. chambers like all, it's, it's all out there like they've even tried remember um, I don't know how to pronounce this the the, the Lukter report that they tried to make in the, the, in the report, yeah, yeah yeah the one they tried to make in the 60s saying that Jews weren't actually gas but then when they went back and revisited it it turns out that all of that was actually even stronger evidence that those gas chambers existed right. um, like That's I mean right. yeah like, I mean like all of this is like well researched Nazi you know? conspiracy too right he was part of the Nazi conspiracy no he wasn't he was just an uninformed business man that made some like bad conclusions no he was actually the number one water. gas chamber specialist in north america for your information he wasn't a and gas after, chamber after, specialist after he, he was a specialist <laughs> in using in using chemicals to de-louse <sighs> fucking material and he was the under the false assumption he was under so the reason why that report was debunked jobs yeah, after so, he yeah, came up we, with I, we can, yeah, we can, we can talk about the reason why this report was debunked his <sighs> problem was that he assumed that the amount of this chemical that you would need to kill humans is the same amount that you would need to kill lice that's just not true so when they were taking apart parts of the wall and they were doing the measurements on these walls and they were like oh wow look there's far too few chemical residue on here to actually kill jews none of them could have been killed in here it turns out later that when they revisited that analysis they were like oh well actually wait the amount of chemical the amount of chemical that you needed to kill people was actually far less like Zyklon B was used in the 1920s to de-louse Mexicans on the U.S. border when they came to work on farms. Okay, and bleach like, is that used to... Million and, Mexicans died? And, and bleach is used to clean floors. You don't think you can commit suicide with bleach? What a stupid fucking point. Are you it's even not, thinking at this not, point? That's, that's, I, I, not, that's you, not the you, same thing at all. Because he... <laughs> All right. Wait, no, no, you're right. It's not the same thing. Just because I can use certain chemicals to I'm do a certain purpose tired. doesn't. I, yeah, I'm sure you're fucking tired. This is taking 120 percent of that fucking brain of yours yeah, to Paul, make up this crazy fucking bullshit. Holy fuck! Fucking you know what? You I will concede one point to you. Okay. All of you fucking white nationalists always say some shit about how, like, even if white people don't have a higher IQ than Asians, we have a higher creative IQ. And after listening to the crazy fucking tales and lies that you spun in this debate, I'm starting to fucking believe it. Because holy shit, you are making up some crazy fucking stories, my dude. 
dude, dude, being being a jerk about it doesn't change the fact that you're fucking losing. Like, I mean, this is the facts. Okay, so you can just keep saying that stuff all you want, but the problem is that you you understand that you have to say these things. If not, like you're gonna you're gonna suffer the same thing. Political distance in this country I suffer. Say whatever the fuck I want to say. The United States of America. You no, know, I, I can't. I've been I saying a lot I, of different I'm things not, over the past not, ten years. I'm, it's pretty I'm obvious. Mostly, you have no you know, idea who the fuck I am. But know, that's okay. You know, you know what, if, if what I was saying was so mm. stupid, why can't I use YouTube? Why can't I use Twitch? Why can't I use PayPal? Why can't why can't people that have my opinions sell books on Amazon? Because we live you in know, a capitalist why, why society. Is, First of all, you probably could self-publish on Amazon. Literally anybody fucking does it. But it's no, because we live in a capitalist society. It's literally, we, we literally, all the we live in a, and yet, and yet opinions, here you are all, all the, fucking all, D-Live. All yet, banned, here you are. They don't want people reading them. If they were as stupid as you think, yep. they would let people read them and let them discredit yet, here themselves. You and are, they do that. Here you are talking to fucking over 10,000 people. You've managed to find yes, a platform regardless. Congratulations. You've done it. There's still a place yeah. for you but yeah i mean if customers don't want a particular thing it's not really that surprising that they would drive that well actually thing out. they banned mine when it was becoming a bestseller that's the weird part isn't it they banned it and then they re-released it but only the adl version not the murphy translation this is on amazon.com you can look this up it's not a conspiracy theory so they they, they no i'm conspiracy I'm you're not because you have all the systems opinions you just push them in the direction i mean talking about incest Shit like that. You're just pushing the direction that the system wants us to go in. You think incest is a disgusting. popular topic that everybody wants to talk about? That's like one of my more popular no, fucking debate not. drivers. No, it's not. It's not, but, it's, it, but it is something that the elites, all this sexual uh, liberation, liberal maximalism, that is an elite opinion, just like trannies and homosexuality and all that all stuff. Right. 30 referendums shot down gay marriage doesn't mean we, have to, we don't have to live with it. We absolutely do. So here's the thing, man. You have the elite opinions. You don't have the popular opinions. And the reason why they, they don't want people to be able to hear or read or see what i'm saying is because they know i'm right and if people were to see it i would change their minds and we would actually actually do something some change in this country that we desperately need so that's why you don't get censored and i do you get pats on the back from the system anyway definitely yeah i've never been banned by twitch before or had anything like that any sponsors threatened or anything like that you're very 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 uh familiar with my history i see i don't remember who started if one of you guys do remember if not, I'll just let Stryker get the f- first final word, even though that was basically the final word, but whatever. Yeah. Well, the, fi- the final word is this, okay? You know, if you're a political dissident in this country, you have to suffer quite a bit, okay? There's a lot of, of, of uh, personal cost, uh, perhaps even you, you have to deal with... You know, the, the, main, the main premise I would have about why we need to do this is, and what we should do is basically just start by expanding the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act and protecting white people with it because today white people are a stateless people. They don't have the same rights as other groups do. In fact, that's almost by design. And then when you go to conservatives, their their response is to uh, try and take everyone's rights. The answer is to give whites rights, to protect free speech in this country, to protect free debate. And we simply don't have that. So, you know, I think this is something that needs to change, and I hope uh, people will keep fighting even if it's you know demoralizing or whatever in the short term because in the end we will win uh let me also shamelessly plug national-justice.com and uh, trs so yeah that's my statement there you go destiny go ahead sir um, I just I have a lot of people like trying to find the passage in this book. Um, I just want to read a bit of from this book uh, that he just cited, saying that that six million number didn't exist in here, or whatever. Um, fr- from mm-hmm. this book, the Nazis, for historical reasons, developed an ideology that led them in 1941 to decide on the annihilation of every Jew, man, woman, or child they could lay their hands on. The only significance in that is that it is what they wanted, and had they been more successful, I would not be here to talk about it. In these thoughts, I may be influenced, I readily admit, by a revulsion from the very idea that the mass murder of nearly six million Jews should have any significance at all in and by itself. But of course, there is the very valid emotional objection to this, namely that it means that the death of all these people, to me, my fellow Jews, with whom most Jews feel an emotional identification just as I do, was in itself meaningless. In other words, that their suffering and death had no meaning in, its, in itself. Um, I think it's funny that in this very book that you quickly, cite... Like it's, quickly, 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 Wait, hold on, quickly. no, 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 this is my closing oh, shit. No, 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 this is my closing shit. Dude, oh, you're fucking, man. you're full of shit. Literally, I'm not letting you're him literally get the last every fucking, oh, every fucking source <laughs> that you've brought up 
right. up has been Missing a fucking my lie. Point. Every <laughs> fucking you point. went through the book. <laughs> it's point. funny because hold actually, on, you know what? It's on. actually funny because hold you did on. the exact same thing that Irving himself <laughs> was accused of doing. No. You leave a broad footnote to an entire oh, fucking book, no. and you hope oh, that nobody no. actually goes and investigates the source to find out that you're no, fucking full wrong. of shit. It's the same thing that every single one of you revisionists do. One hundred percent. Go to the court. My final word. So my final word is that. My gentlemen, word. gentlemen, wait. Let's this forget. is my closing let's... statement. Why is he like I know, yes, I agree. So tell I me what the fuck you're like, I agree. When he's done all oh, this right, right, just let him speak. Stryker, yeah. let him okay. speak. Okay, so I mean, I think it's funny final that statement. in almost yeah. every single topic this guy's brought up where he spews these grand conspiracies, he doesn't even know the fundamentals of how the system works. He doesn't know how art or culture works, which is surprising and funny. He doesn't know basic, like, finance. He doesn't know basic economics. He doesn't know how campaign finance works. He's literally illiterate in almost all of these areas, yet is so fucking smart that he can point out these grand conspiracies that exist in all of these different places. I submit to you that there are a lot of problems that exist in America today, but these problems can be fixed largely within the system, that we can do things like more tax redistribution, that we can have programs like Medicare for All, that we can look at things like the negative impact of technology in our lives without feeling like we have to kick out all the fucking brown people or black people, or like we have to blame the fucking Jews on some weird grand conspiracies that people have claimed for fucking millennia have existed that never pan out to seemingly actually exist. Like, this idea that all of us should band together as white people when we don't even identify that way, which in and of itself is laughable because we don't. And if you go to fucking Europe, we, you fetishize so much, you find that people there don't do it as well. You've got Swedes, you've got fucking Germans, you've got British people. They don't all see themselves as some collective white people. That's a uniquely American concept, which, if anything, demonstrates the idea that whiteness or any of these racial groups are as fluid as you fucking want them to be. If we all became a white people today, then tomorrow we'd become blue-eyed and brown-eyed people. If we killed all the brown-eyed people, the next day we'd become blondes and fucking brunettes. I think we should focus on the real problem problems that exist in America today, the alienation we have from our work, the alienization that's caused by technology, and the alienization that might be caused by our horrible fucking economic policies, and focus on that rather than spreading all these baseless bullshit conspiracy theories that have zero fucking foundation in reality because we're too scared to take a look at the actual problems that impact us. Okay, one last thing because he, he uh, called me out and he is a seemingly good Very point. quickly because technically very now quickly, I have to let him quickly. respond as well. Yeah. You realize that, right? But yeah, okay. The, the, the point of the Caesarini book was not that he doesn't uh, at the beginning, yes, he does say six million. The point is to look at the specific instances where he tracks it. Number doesn't add up; it adds up to four four point two million. Okay, that's the point. Where did the other ones go? It's just like saying, oh yeah, the the Auschwitz museum says six million Jews died, but then they keep changing the plaque and reducing the number of people that died there. Okay, so yes, they're going to stick to the six million number. I'm just saying what the point I was making is that revisionists are having an impact and they're incrementally giving ground. That's the point I'm making. I'm not saying that this book says that uh, it, it's still a firm six million, but the math. Go look at the estimates of all the killings of Jews in the book. Okay, 1.5 million on the Eastern Front, 960,000 at Auschwitz, 1.7 million in action, action Reinhard camps, and 97,000 at Kelmno. So, again, look it up, do the math yourself. Yes. It, somehow 4.2 million adds up to 6 million in his mind, but that's that. This is how it works. All right, Destiny, really quickly, uh -huh. I have to give you a chance if you want to say something quick rebuttal. Uh, I, I mean, good. I mean, it's Nazi napkin math. Like the guy in the book says six million. Like if he wants to go through and selectively edit out like the things that he wants, like Irving himself literally did this. So it's no surprise that he would defend Irving and then like engage in the same ahistorical practices that he does, despite claiming that he has some mysterious history training. There we go. Destiny, Eric Stryker, thank both of you gentlemen for joining me here on the Kill Stream. I hope you guys have a good weekend and stay safe out there with the corona bullshit going around. Mm -hmm. All right. Fair enough. All righty. Good stuff. So not like Apex or I think in the other Call of Duty where people are like murdering you from the fucking, like from the, from the gas like 10 minutes out.